In a moment, we'll, uh, we'll do the pledge. It says stand by, so let's stand by. Now we're getting the five second countdown. It's a long five seconds. Now we're on. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If you can remain standing, uh, Dr. Curtis Smith, if you could approach the microphone, please. Honorable Mayor, members of the council, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen of the community, let us pray. Eternal God, we ask you to invoke the richness of your blessing upon this assembly on behalf of the great city of Santa Ana. For the leaders of our community, the city council, the police and fire departments, first responders, for their extraordinary and outstanding contributions, we are grateful for their performance, their faithful and selfish service to the city and especially to the residents. For those who will be honored tonight with commendation certificates of recognition and proclamation for valuable service rendered as partners and supporters of the community of Santa Ana, and for those who have accomplished remarkable achievements, we are very proud. We pray for them your continued blessing of providential leadership and divine direction in all future undertakings on behalf of the city and for the benefit of all Santa Ana citizens. We ask you to bless the Honorable Mayor and this Council as they conduct the important business listed on the agenda. Guide their actions that they will be positive and successful. May this Council meeting, which was opened by being called to order, be conducted expeditiously with dignity and adjourned in harmony. We pray in your holy name, eternal God. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. And I'm going to call on Mayor Pro Tem uh, Vince Sarmiento to conduct a, a, a ceremony recognition of those that participated in the citizenship fair. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and if uh, everybody who uh, had a role in the citizenship fair a couple of weekends ago will make their way to the um, front here, I want to take a few moments to recognize everybody, and hopefully for all of you who are here and those of you who are watching uh, at home, we're logistically going to be a little bit slow tonight because we're, we're at, an, at capacity and we have some people outside, so please bear with us and be patient with us. We're going to do this as quickly as possible. But we have some outstanding, outstanding people to recognize throughout the night. And I'm, I'm very privileged and honored to have the first uh, recognition to uh, uh, talk about the citizenship fair that took place um, on April 9th. And I, I know many of you who uh, were present, who sent out information, and who uh, helped us uh, spread the word. You know, it was interesting. This is the first time the city's ventured out to do something like this. And so at first, what we did is we went out and tried to do as much outreach as we possibly could. When we realized what an overwhelming response we received, it turned into an outreach effort for volunteers. And that's what we're here to, to celebrate, the response we received from the community to help. Because, um, again, we didn't know what to expect. We just knew that there was an interest, there was a need, and the demand was very high. And I think um, once you start listening to some of the data points that I'm going to share with you, you'll realize how successful it was. So I, I just want to thank those of you who may not be here tonight, couldn't have made it because of conflicts and schedules, and just thank you on behalf of all the residents and on behalf of everybody who received services that, that day. It was, um, it was a great day. People are still um, basking in the glow. These are just some of the faces here that um, lent their time. Uh, you know, everything was free that day. But, you know, just to give you a little bit of background, um, 
some of the groups that joined us, Active Learning, LGP, LGBT Center of OC, Chapman Law School, Fullerton College, LDS, Santa Ana Spanish Stake, Loyola Law School, the Orange County Labor Federation, Public Law Center, Santa Ana College, Santa Ana Youth and Government, Shirt Metal Workers, um, UC Irvine School of Law, UFCW 324, Western State College of Law, and Whittier Law School as well. So let's give all of them a big round of applause because they had a big role. You know, I'm so proud of um, everybody who was there because as the only attorney on the city council, there were a lot of people giving um, very technical, sensitive information, receiving um, you know, sensitive information from the applicants who were applying, and they did it in such a professional way. And you know, we had paralegals, we had law students, we had attorneys, but everybody took their responsibilities very, very seriously. And we had volunteers who were processing. So um, it was an amazing system to watch, and it was very successful. And it made me realize I wish we had done more, because I didn't realize how good we were at this and how, um, how important it was. But um, just to give you an idea, we had uh, about um, 800 people who actually attended the fair. And it's, it, it overwhelmed us because we were expecting maybe a few hundred. We were just hoping to have 100 people and say it's not an empty room. But when we started realizing we were going to exceed our capacity by so much, it was just, um, it was just uh, overwhelming to all of us. 600 applications were processed. We set up 200 future appointments for people who weren't able to be processed that day um, because there's a series of fairs that, that's taking, that are taking place. And we had about 347 volunteers volunteers show up. So um, it was just all in all just a dynamic day. I know Councilman Reyna was there uh, and, and, and we were both just sitting in awe of uh, everything that was going on around us. But these are the faces that spent the entire day. They got trained in the morning. They, w they, they went through and they um, helped process the applications in the morning. They stayed in the afternoon to make sure that they finished up and everybody had a completed application and everybody received what they could. Not everybody could be done. You know, there's sometimes information that's missing, but I guess all in all, what we um, ventured to do was to help people have a voice in their community. Santa Ana has about 37,000 eligible permanent residents that could become citizens and could have a, have a role in this year's election. And nobody was talking about who to vote for, who not to vote for. We just simply said, exercise this right because it's so precious. It's so precious to many of the veterans who are going to be joining us here tonight. They fought for this right for us to be able to exercise our voice, especially in this community that's so underserved it's very vital that we go out and those who are eligible to vote and those who are able to vote, they exercise that voice. So I want to thank everybody. I, I was just privileged to be with you um, there. My wife's an attorney. She brought three of her colleagues from her public interest law firm. They loved it. it I think it was as valuable. I, I hope I'm speaking on behalf of everybody. It was just as valuable to, to, to the volunteers, if not more, to give that information, to help people out. And it was like a one-on-one. -on -one. This wasn't like doing it to a crowd. They actually got to sit down, there was an interpreter, there was somebody processing, and there was an attorney there. It was amazing. And so that's all I can say to describe the experience. But um, I, um, you know, on behalf of everybody who was present, I want to thank everybody who participated. And I want to um, give a shout out to our Santa Ana team who uh, came. And uh, these are employees that came on a Saturday. And, you know, this isn't part of their scope of employment. This isn't part of work. There was no salary involved. They just came because they realized there was a compelling need to help. And those folks are somebody who I, who's dear, near and dear to my heart who works with me, Becky Magallon, who's not here. She's uh, taken the week off. Uh, I think she's still tired from processing all those applications. Uh, Carmen, so if I read your name out, please stand up. Carmen Mora, Daniel Soto, John Funk from the city attorney's office, Jorge Garcia, Juan Lara, Julie Castro, Rocio Mesa, Margarita Macedonio, all of you, I see a few of you back there, thank you uh, on behalf of all of us because we know this is way above and beyond the call of duty. So let's give them a big, a big round of applause.
And so I don't think I missed anybody, but um, we did have friends from Accord, from Unite Here, and uh, you know, just a lot of people who, um, who lent their time. And there's a series of these going on. So I know the diocese is doing something. I know, um, you know labor and others that are concerned about this election cycle being so important. There's a lot of ugly rhetoric out there. And I think folks who are, na who are naturalized and become citizens are the most patriotic folks around. They're the ones who vote at a much higher propensity than those of us, unfortunately, who, you know, are born with that right and that privilege. But folks who become naturalized just exercise their right to vote at a much higher clip. So I, um, I think we did something great. Um, I see some law students here. So who, uh, who can come, or uh, directors of a, of a law school? Julie, do we have somebody who, who's going to come up and speak and say a few words on behalf of all the volunteers who's going to summarize and capsulize everything in a brief comment? <laughs> Hi, Alan Easley. Let's uh, welcome Mr. Alan Easley to the floor and, and give him the, uh, the mic. It's all yours. Thank you. I'm the dean at Western State College of Law, and I just want to say that our students who came out on this special day were thrilled to be able to help out. Um, the staff attorney for our immigration clinic organized everybody, brought everybody together. But part of our mission is to make sure that we're helping our community and especially those who are in most need of help. And those people are often the people who can least afford that help. So any day when we can get some recognition for doing our job is a good day. So thank you. Thank you, Dean, and your, uh, you know, your law student, you should be very proud of all your law students who are there. Um, they're going to make great practitioners. Those of you who were, uh, you know, who were there um, and your colleagues, you got a little taste of what you're going to do and what it is to represent um, people and families with, you know, a lot of fear in their eyes. And I saw a lot of those folks who were sharing information that weren't really sure, but I think you all made them feel at ease as you spoke to them, you were kind to them, you were patient, because these are folks that sometimes don't know whether they should share that information with a stranger, but I know, Roxanne, you did the training for us over at UCI Law School and uh, the Public Law Center, who was extremely helpful, and my colleague, Michelle Martinez, who's the president of Naleo, her organization co-sponsored this event, so big shout out, Michelle, thank you for your sponsorship and your help. And, uh, you know, look, I hope that this becomes something that we do not just once, but we do often, because this is a responsibility that we have to make sure that those of our folks in town are able to exercise an important right. So uh, thank you all. Um, Julie, I'm going to hand you these certificates to make sure everybody gets them on their way out. We have a very uh, uh, long night and a lot of folks, but thank you, Dean Easley, for your words. Thank you. Thank all of you for all your help, and uh, we'll see you at the next one, right? Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for that. Uh, now, Madam Clerk, I'm going to call on Councilor Martinez, and I believe she's going to present some uh, certificates to the Santa Ana High School boys uh, wrestling team. So if the wrestling team can maybe walk up the center aisle and uh, come on down. Yeah, come on down the center aisle. OK, 
Councilman Martinez has the floor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And as our San Ana CIF champs come, let's give them a round of applause. It's a great honor and pleasure to really have you in the house here in the council and chambers these amazing young men and an amazing coach who I've known for almost 20 years. Graduated from Santa Ana High School in 1997. So next year will be my 20th high school reunion. And so it's been a pleasure, Scott known you for almost 20 years and have been able to participate and really see this amazing program over the 20 years and the amazing job that you've done and changed lives. And I know many of these young men who are here today who I've worked with and I just personally want to tell you before I read this because it's really your accomplishments are amazing but I personally would like to tell all of you how proud I am to know that I know you personally, but two, you've put Santa Ana on the map again. And I know it's not easy what you all do every single day on that mat and the dedication and discipline that you've had to take. And so congratulations. And now I'm gonna go ahead and read some key points, but I want Coach Glab to join me up here because I don't wanna steal the thunder because this man is amazing. And what he's been able to do year after year, it's not easy putting a program like this together. And I know sometimes it's not easy dealing with these boys, Scott. And so, you know, thank you for being a leader. Thank you for being a man of God. And thank you for supporting these young men because some of them don't have fathers. And you've been that father figure to them. And many of these young men, through the 20 years that I've known you, and I know plus that you've been coaching. And so with that, I'm only going to say a couple key points, and then I'm going to ask Coach Glab to really talk about this specific team and what it took to, take you, to get you all to the CIF and win the championship. So just... I just want to highlight some stuff about Coach Glab, and then he'll talk about our students. Coach Glab has been the head coach of the boys wrestling team for the past 26 years. During this time, they have won 24 consecutive league titles, 13 CIF championships, and 13 CIF runner-ups. Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. There is no other program like this across the United States, especially with what we have to deal with here in this community. And I see some of our school board members from the Santa Fe School, and I also see our uh, superintendent. Thank you for allowing this man to do the amazing work that he has done in this community for 26 years. Coach Glab, please take it away. Oh, thank, you. thank you, Michelle. Yeah, year in and year out, uh, it's not an easy task, but it's a calling that I have. And as long as I have that calling, I'm going to continue coaching at Santa Ana High School. A lot of these kids I met when they were freshmen, and usually what I do is I spend a little bit more time with the freshman wrestlers than I do with the varsity wrestlers because I figure those are the f that's the future of my program. So a lot of these kids, you can see in them, maybe they don't have a lot of talent at that time, but you can see the, the fire in their eyes and the, the love they have for the sport so early on. So it's kind of worth you know, coaching them and, and putting that effort in. Real quick, I, I want to let you know how dedicated they are. One of my young men, uh, I got a call from the security guard over at school, and they said, hey, is uh, Ricky Navarrete's house on fire? And I go, I, I don't know. And then I come to find out that it was Ricky Navarrete, one of our wrestlers' house was on fire. And um, that kid still came to school that day, and he still came and trained and stayed after school. And most, uh, most kids would have stayed home probably for a week after an event like that. Ricky Navarrete ended up living in a garage behind the house that burnt down through all of wrestling season without any hot water, without a bathroom, without electricity, and still showed up to every single practice and gave 100% effort 
every time he showed up, and he ended up being a CIF champion and went on to the state meet and went three and two. And these are the kind of kids we're coaching. These are remarkable young men. So I just thank you for the support and uh, the love that you guys give us. Thank you, Coach Glavin. I want to give the opportunity for, you know, these two amazing, they're all amazing, but in particular, Ricky Navarrete and Joey Daniel, who won CIF titles um, at their weight class and qualified for state championships. So come on up here. So you guys didn't think I was going to call you guys out, but you, I want you, don't be shy, come up here, to talk about your experience and what does this mean for you? Uh, well... My experience is that in wrestling, I, I learned a lot of life lesson values, and I learned to be very disciplined and determined. And it's going to help me out later on in life because I know whatever I want to accomplish, I got to be very disciplined with myself and very determined to whatever I want to accomplish. And just wrestling changed my life, and it, it saved me from a lot of bad habits and bad influences, you know. And I want to thank Coach Clapp and the team for always being there for me. Thank, thank you. you, Ricky. And now, Joey. Don't be shy, Joey. Don't be shy. Yeah. Oh, I want to say thank you to Glab because he was always there, you know. If we had to get something, he was right there to support it. And wrestling really saved my life from doing a lot of violent stuff with my friends. That was much it. And thanks for everything. Coach Glab, so I'm going to give you all these certificates. Sure. And, and um, again, I want to thank you all for, for showing up and continue to do great work. How many of you are seniors? Wow, the majority of you. And so I just want to wish you all the best of luck as you move forward in, in, in hoping going off to college, right? How many of you going off to college? That's right, glad you're at your hand, you're raising your hand. The future is bright, go and get it. I'm very proud of you. Now I'm going to turn things over to Councilman Marina, and if we can, uh, I know we're going to have Gloria Alvarado come on down. You know, as I have Gloria coming in, and, and, and Coach Glab is leaving before he does leave, you know, he's very modest because it is difficult to win at a championship level. It is more challenging to sustain that. And to be able to sustain that for over two decades is absolutely inc incredible. It's absolutely phenomenal. He carries it so lightly. He's very humble, but his program is truly phenomenal. I just wanted to make sure we, we got that shout out. Um, and I see now Gloria's coming in. Mr. City Manager, we have, uh, there's the students just left for Santa Ana High School. And there's parents Gloria. out there that are also going to be, come on uh, up. that are Don't be shy. supposed to come in and get it recognized. They're not letting them in. Is there any way we can get them? Okay. Thank you. Part of what you hear in the background is that a lot of our students are going to be recognized for our youth sports. And uh, there, there's quite a few uh, students out there. And it, capacity we just couldn't fit them in here out here so we'll be rotating them in so that's just a little bit about what you hear behind me uh, but now for the moment absolutely is 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 a great opportunity to share uh, my passion my city uh, w with a great friend of mine somebody I've met a very long time ago uh, and, and had the same drive in our community and and at first we would just bicker and fight because how we wanted to create these challenges over, overcome these uh, these challenges and create change in our community was always a a, grid, a good battle between us and so many years later we had talked and we had a big dream for our community and so many years later to, to see where we're both at today and what steps she's about to take into and where I'm at today is, is literally surreal to come from the community, to come from those challenges and overcoming those obstacles with the betterment of, I mean, with, with the help of the community so we could be a better off. And, and it is my pleasure today to just talk briefly about Gloria Alvarado. Uh, Gloria Alvarado has been in the city of Santa Ana for over 40 years. She's a mother of four with Mario and Denise and the twins, Joanna and Jonathan, uh, and a grandmother of eight. And she's definitely uh, family oriented. 
Over the years, Gloria's effort has resulted in increased community engagement, coalition building, and system change. She has served the community as a member of a variety of boards and community, uh, uh, committees, including Templo Calvario CDC, AYSO Region 517, Western Community Policing, Santa Ana Building Healthy Communities, Casa Bonita Neighborhood Association Latino Hero Celebrations, Rancho Santiago Oversight, Mini Street, Lion Street, Townsend Street, Weed and Seed Advisory. Where do you have time to help raise these, these kids? Uh, Democratic Party and Vice Chair, uh, Service Employee International 521 Vice President. So that alone is just involvement in our community the time that you've dedicated was is absolutely incredible. And on that end, uh, let me even open up a little bit more as far as information of what Gloria has done in our community. To me, her legacy is co-founder co of the Orange County Immigration Coalition. As you saw earlier, we just recognized uh, the civic leader, uh, sorry, the, the immigration uh, uh, outreach, uh, and she had a big part of that. She had a big role in organizing that. Civic leadership classes, she's educated over 400 community members and had 14 of those individuals appointed to commissioners throughout Orange County, truly leading and empowering others to do the exact same thing. That, that, that's a testament of her leadership. Uh, she leads advocates information campaigns to, to pass restorative justice policies in local schools, which are really to enhance to give our kids a, a second opportunity, uh, enhances collaborations with over 30 nonprofits in the city of Santa Ana through Building Healthy Communities uh, initiative funded through uh, California Endowment. Gloria has received multiple awards for her work, making a difference in our community, including State Assembly Women of Distinction, State Senate Women, and making a difference. Unfortunately, she's going to take all these skills and abilities and, and leave our city, so hopefully she won't go far and won't, come, won't stay long. But she has formally accepted a position with National Citizens of uh, Immigration Campaign Coordinator for the AFL CIO in Washington, D.C. So please join me in giving her a round of applause. I know for one, I'm definitely going to miss you. I, I've bounced off ideas before I jumped in feet first. Sometimes you told me don't do it. Sometimes you pushed me. Uh, and I definitely appreciate that type of support because I believe we all have it within us, but we just need that champion that believes in us. And when we have that, beautiful things are able to happen. You didn't only have effect on me, you had an effect on our community for generations to come, and we're definitely going to miss you. Have fun where you're going, but make sure you come home. What can I say? All, the only thing I can say is thank you. Um, I leave a big family behind. It's been 41 years, actually, here in the city of Santa Ana. I had the privilege to work for the city and continue fighting for the rights of those who need them. Um, I'm taking a big jump, knowing that I have the support, knowing that we have a council here in Santa Ana that will continue doing the work. I'm very proud to say that it is because of their initiative and their connection with the community that we are able to change the lives of immigrants and the immigrant family here in Santa Ana and in Orange County. We are one of those cities that is making a difference and we hope that you will still listen, that you will still continue fighting with us and stand with us. We are your community with 97% Latino in Santana. It is with pride that I say thank you. And I want to thank everybody that's here that's part of my family, from the community, my children, my grandchildren, Valerie Amesqua, and everybody else, Guadalupe, Alejandra, everybody else that's here, thank you so much, because all I, all I have is your support, and that's where we're able to make changes. So thank you. Thank you, Roman. On the behalf of the City of Santa Ana, the Mayor and the Council, we'd like to recognize Gloria Alvarado for your outstanding contributions and dedications to our community. We really appreciate your passion. Say, okay, next we're going to be doing the youth sports. So I'm not sure what's, what row or positions they're coming on out. Um, 
I'm sure most of you know by now that, that youth is definitely my passion in, in sports specifically because for me, it's what saved my life. Growing up in Santa Ana was a very challenging area uh, and I didn't have a lot of options. And, and what really kept me engaged and on the positive path was, was Santa Ana Parks and Rec youth sports programs. At the time, believe it or not, it cost $7 to join our, our after school uh, sports programs. And at the time when I joined, I had to be put on a payment plan for seven bucks. Today, too many of our families are still facing those challenges. Today, too many of our kids don't have choices or options. And this is why I really want to recognize the work that they're doing, not only for their sportsmanship, but for utilizing their time in a positive capacity. By being around other students that are like-minded, that are facing the same struggles, that collectively can move through these. To me, there's no greater impact in a person's life than another caring human being. And today, we're going to be recognizing a lot of the volunteer coaches and the hours that they intentionally put into another child. Not their own family, but somebody else. That's the content of their character. That's the fabric of our community. And I believe this needs to be celebrated. It's difficult to put everybody in here at one time, but we're going to do what we can. So don't be shy. Scoot on over. Tantito más. Tantito más. Go down. Slow down over. Come on in. Co, 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 co. All right. Go multiple rows, uh, Roman. You yeah, got to get more rows. Little guys in front, big guys in back. Big guys in the back. Which group is this? Your basketball coaches? So this is all of them, right? All right, cool. All right, let's start off. Don't be shy. Keep coming on in. And, and, and I see giving a little direction. You got Ed Raya giving a little bit of direction out here. What's funny is I met Ed when I was a young person. His, uh, his brother, Leon Raya, was one of my first coaches. And, and, and by default, right, uh, I ended up playing a lot against him. I, I was really good at that time, so we won. All right, so um, 2016 Youth Sports Basketball Program began January 2nd with over 475 registered participants. This was the largest in Santa Ana history to be able to provide a youth sports boys program from the ages of 3 to 14, uh, and they were able to play eight league games uh, from Division A to C, and so a lot of the people you see me behind that it comes from that. Uh, the closing ceremonies took place at Salgado Recreational Center March 5th uh, and at Godinez High School Sunday, March 5th. Over 110 volunteers uh, and 475 participants were recognized for their contribution to youth sports. Some of the season highlights, 47 teams, 475 participants, all brand new jerseys, which I absolutely fell in love with, 110 volunteers, 110 volunteers, 660 hours donated a week, 5,940 hours volunteered during the course of the sports program. Please join me in round thanking them so much for that dedication. That is absolutely incredible. <laughs> to me, time is the most valuable thing that we possess. Because once we spend it, we don't ever get it back. And how we choose to spend our time speaks volumes of what's important to us. And these volunteers, these 110 volunteers, dedicating their time to serve other people to serve our community, again, speaks volumes of their character. That, again, is the fabric of our community. We cannot do it alone. We need everybody at the table rolling up their sleeves to get to work and help raise a child. I'm a firm believer it takes a community to raise a child. And again, I'm just blown away by 5,900 hours in one season. Behind me, we have a couple of coaches, and I'm going to ask the first coach to come on up here, Division A coach, uh, Coach Ed Raya, and he's, this is his sixth year coaching the boys' sports and girls' basketball program. He's led the league to multiple championship and an uh, 8-0 league record this year. So uh, please spoke, talk a little bit more about your team. Um, we were the uh, A division champions this year. We were undefeated. We actually went to the Orange County Finals, and we won one game. We lost one game. And I'm very proud of my boys. I'm very proud of the parents for all the participation. I want to thank Gerardo Moet and his staff for a wonderful program they put together. He's got some good staff people. Um, and I want to thank my assistant coach, all the coaches, for all the work they do. But my assistant coach, Ignacio Salazar, I've coached with that man for two years. He's a wonderful leader. Uh, he spends a lot of time in the community. Uh, he's an inspiration to the boys. He's hard on them, but he's always teaching them about life and life lessons. And it's been a pleasure to coach with Ignacio for the last two years. So thank you very much.
Division B champions, Lakers, Coach Nick Sanchez. Please come up and share with your students. About 6'2"? 6'5". My name is Nick Sanchez. Uh, I'm the Division B uh, championship coach uh, for the Lakers. I just want to thank uh, my assistant coach that couldn't be here, uh, Israel Aldana, and again to all the parents for the sacrifices. Uh, we actually, I don't know if all the other teams, but we actually held uh, three practices a week. So, I mean, it was a lot of work, but at the end it uh, paid off. And just again, thank you for the opportunity and to all the parents. And from our Division C champions, the, the Heat, Coach Espinosa. Hi, I'm Jose. Um, we coach the Division C um, Heat. Um, it was an honor to have this great, great group, group of kids, and um, it was my first time coaching. Um, I had a lot of fun, and um, I thank it all to my parents that always dedicated having the kids there on time, and we had a great season. Thanks to my coach, Johara, and um, I'm, I'm ready to do it again next year. We have about a hundred and some, so I'm just going to read one. But uh, definitely appreciate this. And so this is to all the recognition of the volunteers and the coach. This one's specifically for Coach Ed Guzman from the Bulls and recognition of all your volunteer service to the 2016 basketball and your dedication to the commitment to the city of Santa Ana's youth. Again, join me in, in around giving them a round of applause. We couldn't do it without them. Thank you so very much. So I don't know how we're going to try to take a group photo, but let's try. Let's give them all a big applause. Not sure what the fire marshal would have said, but I think this is the most people I've ever seen in the council chambers. Good job, good job everybody. Now I think our next up presentation is uh, Councilmember Sal Tinajero. He's ready to go on down, and if uh, we can get uh, uh, possibly uh, Rick Miller, if you can be on standby, please. And then I think there's going to be some certificates of award for the uh, speech and debate uh, students. So I'll turn things over to Councilmember Sal Tinajero. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'd like to call up the Santa Ana Unified School District, members of the Santa Ana Unified School District. I know we have some board members out here. We have our superintendent, uh, Dr. Miller, and also members of the Kiwanis Club, uh, Mr. Alfredo Amesqua. He's one of our attorneys here in town, if you guys could come on up. And I'd like to also call up all of our coaches and our championship uh, award winners. to wear your Oh yeah, have me. 
All right, this is an amazing group. And so I want to share something with you. There was a study done back in 2006. And I want you to know that in that study, it showed that if your parents graduated from college, your child, the child of a college graduate, starts kindergarten with a thousand English vocabulary words. If your child, if, if you did not graduate from college, but you graduated from high school, your child enters kindergarten with 600 vocabulary English words. If you didn't finish high school or you're living in poverty, those students typically enter kindergarten with only 300 English vocabulary words. And if you've ever seen Honey Boo Boo, the show Honey Boo Boo, this is an English speaking family and you have to use subtitles to understand what they're saying. So it's one of those, and I know it's something that we can joke about, but the reality is it's a truth. And what the study showed was that your lowest, your highest achieving fourth grader, the great fourth grader that is reading at the highest level, is reading higher than your lowest achieving twelfth grader. I mean, it's amazing. It's all about vocabulary and fourth grade is the marker. If your child is doing well by fourth grade, you can predict how their educational uh, stability or, or success is going to go along the way. So everyone increases by one full year every year, but no one's, people don't start in the same place. So how do we catch students up? And I forgot to mention, the study did not account for kids like me who spoke Spanish going into kindergarten. I knew two English words, yes and tomato, and I thought it meant tomorrow. <laughs> you know. So then you're probably wondering, but Councilman Tinajero, how did you become such a mental giant? Well, I'm going to teach you right now. <laughs> I'm just playing. The reality is this. Our students, you've heard of Common Core, deals with writing, but it also deals with vocabulary and being able to express yourself. We are immersing our students into rhetoric, into vocabulary. They're getting to learn amazing poets, amazing writers, and they get to talk about current issues. Their topic this year was resolved that the federal government should what? Ban, does anyone remember? Ban private prisons. That was their topic. And so they, they debated for and against it. This would not have happened if it wasn't for two organizations, two individuals, and I'm going to introduce one of them right now. I'd like to call up Dr. Rick Miller, if he can come on up. So, Dr. Miller, uh, this does not happen without leadership in our district that truly is forward thinking. And this is what I appreciate about Dr. Miller. He came together when the Kiwanis Club and, and Dr. Miller met. He quickly, didn't hesitate, said, yes, let's do this. Let's create an opportunity that usually only wealthier school districts or private school districts, get an, uh, those students get an opportunity to participate in. We're going to bring it here in Santa Ana. So we're going to honor him today. And I want to read this proclamation. I won't read the whole thing because I know some of you guys want to eat dinner tonight. But I think we need to give him his just due. And it says, Dr. Rick Miller, whereas Dr. Rick Miller is a superintendent for the Santa Ana Unified School District and has served as a superintendent since 2013. And whereas Dr. Miller worked to build a collaborative environment within the school districts and the city to establish more opportunities for students and families. And whereas, with the support of Dr. Miller, the Santa Ana Unified School District, in collaboration with the Kiwanis Club, sponsored its first, notice I said its first, because there's going to be a second, speech and debate tournament at McFadden Intermediate School on March 5th, 2016. Whereas over 100 intermediate students participated in the tournament, and whereas Dr. Miller's spirit and enthusiasm of speech and debate in Santa Ana Unified has propelled it to become a positive endeavor for students to enhance their communication and presentation skills. Now, therefore, we, the mayor and the city council, do hereby congratulate and recognize a great individual and a great leader in our community, Dr. Rick Miller. I think they tricked me. They said that I was here to recognize the kids. That's why we're here, right? We also wanted to recognize your leadership. 
Well, thank you very much. And um, frankly, I'm struck by the great students that we have in this district. And if I could take a moment and just share one thing about that. So I'm going to depart from the speech and debate. That was a great event. And if you missed it, you really missed it. You missed something that was great. But I'd like to share uh, Valley High School. This year, we're going to have five graduates. We're going to have a lot more than that, but five in particular. And those five, there's some things that are going on. One is that one's going to Harvard, Rosa. We have two others, um, Carlos and Adriana. Carlos, um, if you looked at him, you'd say he's kind of dressed in gang attire, some things like that. That's a good thing sometimes. That's protective. But uh, when he interacted with one of our folks, he pulled out of his pocket a paper and handed it to her. She said, what's this? He said, that's my transcript. Because people misjudged me. And it was full of A's and full of AP. Adriana serves on my student advisory group. Both of them have full rides to Cornell. Carlos wasn't sure he wanted to accept it because he's waiting to hear from Brown. <laughs> We're not done. That's three now. One, two, three, right? Number four, the student, uh, actually they tell me he's smarter than all the rest of them. That's a student uh, representation. Just got a $40,000 scholarship from Edison. He's going to go to an engineering school, probably Caltech, MIT, something like that. And the last student, we were informed, I believe, on Monday night that she has a Gates Millennium Scholarship. Wow. Gates Millennium, that's not a scholarship to go to the first year. That's all the way through your BA all the way through your master's, all the way through your PhD, full funding for the entire area. That's our Valley High School. That's our kids. Thank you very much. I'd like to come call up uh, Mr. Alfredo Amesqua and members of the Kiwanis Club if they could come on up here. And we have a couple of recognitions. I received a phone call from Mr. Alfredo Amesqua and the Kiwanis Club, inviting me to their office. And they said, Sal, we'd like to do something that's going to change the lives of students here in Santa Ana. Could you help us create a speech and debate competition here in the city? I looked at him and my lip quivered. I said, you better not be fooling. <laughs> and they weren't. Uh, they, this, this event could not have taken place without their backing and their vision for something special here in Santa Ana. Now they're the talk of all the other Kiwanis clubs around Orange County. They're all wondering how they could do it at other districts. So I want to recognize them tonight, and again, I'll just read a couple of paragraphs. Uh, it says, whereas on March 5, 2016, the Kiwanis Club, in collaboration with the Santa Ana Unified School District, sponsored its first speech and debate tournament that included all Santa Ana intermediate schools. And, or I'm sorry, whereas there were seven categories of competition for students that included original oratory, duo interpretation, impromptu speaking, prose interpretation, poetry interpretation, and oratorical declamation, and public forum debate. Whereas the Kiwanis Club serves the Santa Ana community changing lives, one child, one community at a time. Now therefore, we the mayor and the city council do hereby congratulate and recognize the Santa Ana Kiwanis Club for their contribution to the community and for sponsoring the speech and debate tournament. And I want to add to that for changing the lives of students here in Santa Ana because many of these students are inspired right now to come back and do even more next year. So I'm really excited for them as well. I also have an award here, a recognition for Alfredo Amesqua for the creation and organization of the first annual Santa Ana Unified School District Kiwanis Club Speech and Debate Sweepstakes Tournament. Mr. Amesqua was at every meeting, he chaired the meetings, met with all of the coaches, all of the principals, met with the board members. He was constantly working uh, to make sure that this activity came to fruition. And so I want to thank you for your time and dedication because 
the, the only, I, I saw what the gratitude was for you. What he was excited about watching our students excel and the excitement in their faces. So I want to give Kiwanis Club Alfredo Mesco a few moments and I want to present you with this proclamation. Please hang it up somewhere prominent because what you're doing now is something that people are going to talk to for many, many generations to come. Thank you, Mr. Mesco. Good evening, good evening, good evening. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, members of the City Council, I, first and foremost, I want you to know that my daughter is here, and I want to make sure that she comes this way. Valerie, come on up here. S some of you may or may not know that she's also the, a member of the school board, and I'm so proud of her because she is the next generation of leadership. You know, the, the, the people that, the, the, the council that sits behind me right now I think you are, you have to be so proud of the work that they're doing today. With the wonderful staff, the city manager, and every action that they do, they really reflect what we should have been done 20 years ago. 20 years ago. And so we as a club, as the Kiwanis Club, and several of the members of our club are present, we strongly believe that the one way to change our community, the one way to make a difference in our community, is to help our youth. So every time that we meet, which by the way, we meet every Wednesday for lunch. Some of you may, may want to join us, let us know. We'll be more than happy to have you as our guest. But we meet every Wednesday for lunch and we talk about how, how we can do things better for our community. So if any of you ever have an idea, every, at any time every, some of you may have some thoughts about what we can do as a club. And by the way, this club is almost 100 years old, okay? I'm one of the, I'm one of the young members of the club, okay? <laughs> and so, so, those of, so those people that are watching us on, on cable, please join the Kiwanis Club. But I want you to know that, uh, I want you all to know and to meet the president, this year's president, I'm not the president, I'm only the chair of this committee. I want you all to meet, and I'd like for him to say a few words, Mr. David De Leon. David, come up here, please. Buenas tardes. Thank you. Thank you, Senor Mesqua. Thank you for City Council and Mr. Tinajero for helping us to be our, our crew chief and guiding us through these waters. I want to add to Dr. Miller's uh, review of the students from Valley High School. He forgot to mention Long Fam. In addition to go deliberating between MIT, he has a hard decision between Notre Dame and USC. And there's two other students that are like, well, I don't know if I should go to USC or UCLA. And, that's, and all those students that were mentioned, those extraordinary students, are part of Key Club at Valley, which is also a program that Kawan is, uh, sponsors and is a part of. But to be a part of this, I couldn't be more grateful to be a part and be shoulder to shoulder with such incredible people. And to all the students that are here, I couldn't be more proud of you. So I, I really hope this sparks an interest and a passion to succeed and get ahead because w you have everybody here in this, that's in front of you, everybody that's behind you, we're all behind you, we're all supporting you. So congratulations and thank you for your time. And, and I just want to let everyone know that uh, this wonderful tournament that we had on April 5th could have not been done without the assistance, the leadership, and the direction of our very own Sal Tinajero. So let's give him a big round of applause. Sal, thank you so very much for everything, okay? I have a stack of certificates. I'm going to ask if someone from Kiwanis can pass them out to the students afterwards and the coaches. Are there, if I have parent, these were our champions, by the way. These were our champions, okay? We have the, I, I think we have finalists and champions. What was interesting was that all of our champions were women yeah. in this tournament. Yeah. <laughs> so that was pretty cool to see that the championship circle was all women. But um, I, I want to ask parents, if the parents of our students that are here, can you please stand? The parents, are they, if they're here, can you please stand? Let's give them a round of applause.
And I just want to warn you, your kids will start debating you a little bit more, so be ready <laughs> to counter their arguments. Um, we want to recognize our coaches as well. Many people don't understand. Teachers don't just come in and teach from 8 o'clock to 3 o'clock. We spend time grading papers. We spend time, we're kind of counselors sometimes, working with our kids. We're motivators, trying to continue to encourage them. Starting something for the first time is not easy because you, the, all they have is your trust. And what you, what you say, now that they've experienced it, wasn't it fun? Now that you experienced it, you're telling others you need to do this. So it gets easier, but they still have to put time in, their own time. Many of these coaches brought food for the kids, brought waters. They were concerned about what they were going to need for the day. These are an extension of the family. And so I want to give a round of applause to all of our coaches who are here. And I'd like to name our champions, so if you could please stand, or step forward and wave so that everybody knows who you are. Leslie Alatorre. Good smile, wait. Cielo. Is it Echegoen? Echegoen, yes, oh yeah. Samantha Lopez. Is Samantha here? She couldn't be here today? What about Christy Wynn? Come on up. Noemi Portillo. Yeah. All right. Grace Tinajero. Yeah. Caitlin Vu. Yeah. And last but not least, Yalena Watros. So these are your champions. These are your champions, and uh, hopefully you guys will continue to work and, and uh, continue to perfect your craft. So congratulations. And I'd like to call up the coaches. And our, our coaches are For, uh, Forrest Barber, All right. Lathrop Intermediate, my old stomping grounds, uh, Patrick Chang, is he here today? Let, let's do this. Let me call their names, and we'll give them one big round of applause. Hannah Chapman, she's here. Uh, John Degree, John Henrissi, uh, Andrew Pagan, Candy Palau, Ryan Ramirez, Corinne Serrano, Kelly Soner, and Suzanne Whitmire. Let's give all of our coaches a round of applause. And just for the record, in fourth place, it was Sierra Academy. In third place, it was Lathrop Intermediate. In second place, it was MacArthur Fundamental. And taking the first place trophy this year and will be the defending chap going into next year, McFadden Intermediate School. So thank you very much. Congratulations. Well done. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to now uh, proceed with the council meeting and uh, take a few things out of order because I know we're going to be losing council members here early today and I'm going to try to do uh, uh, as much business as possible. So, uh, so I'm going to first uh, direct our attention to item 65A. It's a proposal with uh, AM Cal Housing um, for the award of inclusionary housing NLU fees. And um, I don't know if we need a staff recommendation on that. I think we already um, have some information. Ms. City uh, Manager, would you like to say anything? No. Uh, this is on the inclusionary fees? Yeah, 65A. We have, a, uh, we have had very thorough discussions. We followed up as directed by the City Council, and our recommendation is in the report. So with that, does anybody wish to address us, um, or is MCAL available for comment? That's a follow-up question for staff. All right, I'll go ahead, a follow-up question. So we, at the, at the uh, meeting where we did, where we discussed uh, this item briefly last, some of the feedback from council uh, was to go back and discuss uh, the amount of uh, funds uh, 
uh, obsidian new funds that would be dedicated towards this project. Uh, and uh, what's being recommended here tonight, just want to confirm that uh, staff feels it is, is accurate and consistent with other uh, comparable projects. Can you just speak to, that, that sure. was one of the questions, the amount uh, that would be potentially designated uh, of uh, housing, affordable housing dollars towards this project? Yes, uh, Councilman uh, Benavides, the uh, uh, developer proposed a request for about $8.9 million. Uh, it's all contingent upon receiving the funds or a portion thereof. Uh, we did review it. I forwarded it to the City Council, a report from Kaiser Marston, and they concurred, uh, concurred that that amount of funding was appropriate. Okay. Just wanted to make sure that we had followed through and done some of the due diligence, done the comparisons, and that, that staff feels comfortable. And, and can support and is supporting and recommending the, the, the dollar amount that's being dedicated. So with that, I would entertain a motion. I'll move it. Second. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 aye those opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Now I think I need to go item 75C, which is an associated item to the one we just discussed. And so, Madam Clerk, I'm now going to declare that this is the time and place for a public hearing to consider General Plan Amendment 2016-1, Amendment Application 26-1, and Environmental Impact Review 2016-14 uh, for the First Street Family Apartments Project located at, uh, proposed at 1438 and 1440 East First Street. This is the MCAL Multi-Housing 2 LLC applicant. Uh, if we have no questions, let me right now just go ahead and open up the public hearing and ask, does anybody wish to address us on this item? Seeing no one, I will close the public hearing and bring it uh, to Council for consideration. Any thoughts or, re or would somebody wish to recommend? Uh, uh, or approve the recommended motion. Entertain a motion to move the item. Second. It's 75C. It's the MCAL. So it kind of like corollary to what we just discussed. This is the actual uh, public hearing. Initially, uh, initially we were looking at some of the, the, the funding allocation at this point. Now it's the actual. Uh, it's approving uh, adopting the mitigated well. negative DAC, adopting a resolution, placing the ordinance on first hearing. So with that, um, can I have a vote? Those in favor, please say aye. 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 If I can just make a quick comment. Just quick comment before the vote is concluded. Uh, when it comes to that area, if years ago the council identified and, and talked to staff that this is one of the areas, uh, gateway into the city along First Street, uh, carry up for uh, opportunity for, for improvement and development. Uh, we've, I've had an opportunity at the last meeting, last time we heard this, had not yet had an opportunity to review the project, to look at the application, to look at the, the renderings. Uh, and I just want to commend both the applicant and staff when it comes to the actual architecture, to the materials, to the design. Uh, it is an affordable uh, project, provide dignified housing to, to families. Uh, but one of the, the, uh, the things that I, am, uh, that I saw is that the, uh, the standard and quality of, of design in the project is something that we can all be proud of. Looks market rate there is also uh, even though there isn't necessarily a direct mixed use uh, uh, element to it, uh, it, it contributes to, I think, something that we want to see uh, along there is that, that mixed use element. It, there, it has that, that uh, mixed uh, use uh, um, uh, aesthetic and, and view if you're coming along First Street. So all that just to say that uh, it, uh, commend staff, commend uh, the developer, and just want to see uh, more of this type of, of project definitely would like to actually see future projects actually incorporate some of the, the, the mixed use uh, retail and other but this is uh, I, I feel uh, at the project in and of itself a good uh, start towards what we can see along that that west uh, that east uh, side corridor into uh, first street All right, now to my right, Councilor Martinez. Please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I thought I was going to get denied. Um, I, I first <laughs> off just um, one, want to thank our staff and also the developer. I actually had the opportunity to meet with him. And, you know, I'm, I'm one of the council members that tends to be very critical and, and reviews of things very thoroughly, whether it be on the staff side or on the applicant side. And I wanted to make sure, um, you know, to meet with him to make sure that the standard um, was a high one. And I, I, and I do just want to thank Mario for, for, for one, being prepared 
and two, being able to provide me the information that I needed to, to feel comfortable as we move forward on this corridor and the importance. And I do want to come in and, and just echo what um, Councilman Benavides just mentioned, is that even though there's not a mixed-use component, just the feel that it's going to be providing in that area. And as we move forward in the first street corridor, which I believe is a very important corridor for the city of Santa Ana, and as we move forward, we have a lot of opportunity. It's right near a five, the five freeway. It's near our, our, um, our Santa Ana Zoo. Um, to me, that corridor, whatever we decide to do near the five freeway, um, as right adjacent to our zoo, I look at that area as a family fun zone area. And as we continue to provide that kind of housing, just wanting to make sure that we continue to have that kind of high standard. And, and I just want to thank the applicant for really um, having um, set that bar for us and just moving forward with the open space as well that is very needed in our community, wanting to connect active transportation and public transportation is very vital, uh, specifically for the community that will be living in, um, in, in that development. And with that being said, Mr. Mayor, I support the project. All right. We may have additional comment, I believe, Mayor Pro Tem. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, um, you know, I think it's all been said. I, I wanted to thank staff. I wanted to thank the market rate developer with the underlying project, I believe, that uh, went out and found a companion project to address a really vital need on a, on a gateway into the city. Uh, for many of you who don't know where this is, this is that um, uh, area on First Street between the Five Freeway and Grand Avenue. It's unfortunately fallen into decay. Um, there's a lot of old, old hotels that you, you know, unfortunately don't perform like they did. But there's a lot of exciting stuff going on now on First, and we identified this. So I want to thank and congratulate my colleagues, because I know years back when we identified this corridor in the housing element, we said, you know, this is an area that's really important to the city. People, as they come into our downtown and exit off the 5 freeway, exit off the 55, the first thing they see is this street. And um, we saw that there was an opportunity there. Now you see some exciting things with the Lion 1901 project. You see the old Ramada Tower that's now becoming an assisted living facility that's beautiful. Um, the Elks, where the old Saddleback Inn was, is going to be um, developed. And now with this project anchoring that west part of First, um, you know, it's going to be a very nice entryway into the city. And I think it just continues to anchor the revitalization of that one corridor. And, you know, I've seen so many people be critical of, of all the negative things on that street. We're going to be bringing close to 70 families into that area. And what's unique about this project is that a lot of these units are two, three, and four bedroom. And that's what we need because, you know, single, single um, unit apartments and, you know, one bedroom apartments, that's just not our demography. We have families with, you know, with a lot of needs, and this is hopefully going to be addressing that, creating a community and a neighborhood, I think, as a council member said. It's right by the zoo, so the kids will be able to walk to the zoo. They'll be able to walk to via uh, intermediate and all the other schools that are nearby. And so it really is, I think we're at a moment where we're creating a community on that First Street corridor. So I'm very proud of all of us and um, uh, everybody who had a role in this, and I want to thank you know, all the directors who had a hand in helping us navigate through this because this is kind of the way we did this at the station district. And if you look at Santa Ana Boulevard now compared to what it was, it's a neighborhood there. It's a beautiful, thriving neighborhood. And we hope that uh, with this, First Street will be the same. So with that, uh, I'm also going to be supportive of it. And I think um, it'll make us all proud. Councilor Tina Hero, please. Mr. Mayor is really enthusiastic. He's like, oh, geez, he wants to talk too. No, but the, re the reality is this, is that uh, this is affordable housing. This is affordable housing. And the affordable housing today is very different from what it used to be. This affordable housing is life-changing and breaks the cycle of poverty because it has a community area with computers where students actually get tutored when they come home. So if you have a son or a daughter and the parents are working till 5, 5.30 in the evening, there's a place for them to go and uh, get tutoring to increase their grades. That never existed, and that's all paid through the rents that people pay for this particular project. And so I just want to thank our council because our council has been very forward-looking and assuring that as many, as, as many of these units that we could possibly bring up in the city are there to give people a dignified standard of living. Again, a dignified standard of living. 
because then our students reach new heights. And so it's just one step of many. And I just want to applaud everyone and our staff and the developer for really uh, deciding to invest here in Santa Ana. Any, any more comment? Yes, please, Cindy uh, Thank Manager. you, Mayor. I, I normally don't do this, especially when the, the votes seem to be going along the staff recommendation. But I do want to thank the Mayor and the City Council for their leadership. Uh, just this week, Hassan and I met with developers. Exactly to your point, they want to invest there. They want to do mixed-use development. The Metro East planning extension is going to be very, very helpful. And so uh, we're very grateful to the Mayor and the Council for their leadership. Well, and with that, um, I think this is going to be a wonderful project along First Street, along with, I think, other good projects that can come there and really assist that corridor. So with that, those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries unanimously. So now what I want to do is I want to, again, take things out of order and direct our attention to item 65B. Uh, this is a receive and file. So it... Um, uh, I think we're going to take a lot of testimony and we're going to continue to wrestle with this issue, but the testimony tonight's important, and, um, and so I'm just going to begin now and basically say that uh, this is a receiving file. Mayor? Yes, go ahead. Just a point of clarification. Uh, there are some actions being recommended. In addition to the receiving file, that's one of four actions. Yes. And we do have a, a presentation if you want us to make Okay, yeah, yeah, I do. So this is a receiving file council update regarding the Santa Ana Jail. <laughs> Authorization of draft request for, you know, qualifications for re jail reuse study. Also authorization to enter into negotiations with the POA. And also uh, authorization to continue development of transgender care pilot. And... Um, I think, uh, you know, ultimately it could be one or two or three or four of all the above. Um, I stress I think it's going to be a work in progress because I don't think in one evening we're going to resolve this. But, um, uh, no, let's go straight to this. I think we got a lot of folks waiting for this. So let's go straight to this. So um, let me just call on the first uh, of many speakers. But before that, Let's uh, go ahead and we'll have a staff presentation. Thank you. And um, we, we do have a, a short presentation, Mayor and Council members, and of course uh, we're available for uh, questions. So uh, just to give an update uh, from the February 2nd, uh, Decision and uh, on page two of this report. You had to write one the first time. Okay, who's working the slides? Okay, here we go. Next, uh, this was the, uh, the motion that was uh, made at the February 2nd meeting, obviously, to uh, deny the contract, engage the community. We've done that uh, very extensively to look at options and to come back. Uh, with uh, proposals uh, to uh, related to the jail services. I do want to quickly go to uh, the Chichizic plan. Uh, we were uh, very successful in trying to uh, modify the, the Santa Ana jail business model, identify short and long-term goals to effectively meet the needs of the community uh, through contract negotiations, uh, and I can give you some examples of that. One of the issues we had to deal with right away was a, a very serious um, uh, per deem uh, increase that was needed, and it was the first one in eight years. Uh, we did get uh, concurrence from the council to seek that, and we were successful in getting a 28% increase from 82 to $105 a day. Uh, very quickly, uh, background on the jail, we have 512 beds, uh, and uh, of that amount, 99% are federal uh, detainees, so uh, the long and the short of it is uh, most of our business, vast majority, is, is federal contracts. Uh, a little bit over half of uh, ICE detainees, U.S. Marshal, and some uh, Bureau of Federal Prisons. We uh, started in this business uh, in 1994 with U.S. Marshals. Uh, the, the, the short uh, story is we built this jail out of a need for Santa Ana. After we did that, the county uh, basically said you can uh, 
how's your uh, your 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 uh, jail detainees in the county jail at no cost so we entered into these contracts and we did have an agreement with uh, ice in 2006 and to uh, try and um, diversify our, our reliance on ice we were successful in negotiating a federal uh, uh, Bureau of Prisons contract we uh, also uh, have uh, worked really hard related to our uh, transgender population module uh, we're one of the first uh, dedicated transgender detained modules in the ICE system. Uh, the uh, city of Santa Ana has uh, worked really hard to provide the utmost in respect and dignity for this population. Uh, we've uh, realized that. Uh, we've been known uh, for what we're doing. And as, and as a result of that, there has been a proposal uh, to uh, do a, uh, a pilot program, uh, Transgender Care and Classification Committee, uh, was incorporated and that was the proposal that was not approved at the February 2nd um, meeting uh, we um, need to be very clear that we've had uh, lots of meetings lots of discussions there still is uh, some disagreement on how this should be done uh, we do need to know that uh, um, the federal government has said to us they need an answer by June 1st uh, as to whether or not we're going to do the pilot if we're not going to do the pilot that sets into motion a whole another set of circumstances if the council approves this evening continued discussions we would come back on may 17th uh, with uh, with those discussions we continue to work with the community uh, but that's one of the reasons why we're asking for a may 17th return date on the pilot we've had uh, lots of engagement with the community we've had seven meetings uh, march 3rd 4th 7th 17th 30th april 4th april 6th we also had a meeting with uh, uh, Jerry Serrano and, and uh, John Franks with the POA uh, to talk about the impact on the uh, employees and the jail. All the community groups are listed there, uh, all the way from ACLU to uh, Human Rights Watch. Uh, very, very uh, clearly, uh, the question was asked, uh, how do we sustain the jail without the use of federal dollars? Uh, we don't believe that's feasible uh, at, at this point uh, because of the 99% um, federal uh, reliance on con uh, federal contracts uh, again uh, we made major headway in the last few years paying down the debt but we still uh, have a balance of 24.3 million the annual loss without the ice contract at least in the short term would be anywhere from three to five million dollars and so uh, we don't believe at this time it's financially sustainable without federal dollars we uh, have taken steps to reduce our reliance and increase our options uh, in addition to increasing the per diem, we haven't hired any full-time staff uh, since my arrival as city manager. I do want to thank the POA and their, and their leadership for, uh, for making that concession. It's very unusual, but they did it. Uh, we had a, 110 full-time staff, and now we have 93. So that's 17 fewer full-time staff. We have 23 part-timers. Uh, the debt's been reduced from $30 million to $24 million. One thing I want to emphasize to the city council today is that if we don't, uh, receive approval this evening to continue the discussions and come back on uh, the 17th of May then uh, effective tomorrow we would uh, uh, separate uh, or combine uh, excuse me the modules because we don't have enough people in the modules to make it work in fact uh, we're losing $80,000 a month in overtime we only have um, 31 individuals in the gay bisexual module that's designed for 64 and 27 in the transgender module, which is designed for 64. You could, so you can see we have to staff those modules and, and, and without some hope for the future, it won't work. Um, we, um, we have already on the, in, the, in the council report today a contract to uh, lower our cost by $100,000 in the U.S. Marshals contract. We uh, are asking for some options. Uh, we need more time. We would like to do a, a request for a qualification for a jail reuse study. This is not a privatization study. This is everything's on the table. We would actually include the community, all the organizations we're working with, the labor representatives, and we would say, how can we reuse this jail? How can we do uh, a phase out? What options are available? And we expect that to cost at least $100,000. Uh, in conclusion, uh, Mayor, Member of the City Council, we're asking permission to issue the RFQ to continue community engagement. Uh, unfortunately, enter into negotiations with the POA to uh, offer retirement incentives to full-time staff. 
again, to uh, reduce our reliance on the full-timers. We don't expect a lot of people to take them. Our understanding is about 10 or 12 people are, are eligible, but we would like to uh, at least explore that. And then uh, the final uh, item for, for, for uh, your consideration is to continue to discuss options with Department of Homeland Security regarding the uh, TCCC pilot uh, and come back on May 17th uh, for your consideration. That concludes our report. Thank you. So uh, we're now going to begin taking a public testimony. Um, and let us begin with uh, Ken Willard, followed by Jamie, Jamie uh, Mandriquez, and then Felipe Hernandez. So Ken Willard, if you're here, please come on forward. Uh, good evening. My name is Ken Willard. I was born and raised in Santa Ana. I went to Santa Ana schools. I graduated from Valley High School. Proud to hear the props earlier today. And I've worked for the city for 25 years. A couple of months ago, uh, the TCCC was before this council, and a group of people came uh, to the council and spoke negatively about our jail and our police department uh, and the necessity for this federal housing agreement. Um, there were accusations of violations of law, violations of civil rights, um, violations are just basic human decency. They're happening in your facility. Um, and those went unanswered. Um, Excuse well, me, sir. The matter's would, here you before mind, you tonight. Would you mind pulling the mic up a little bit closer to you? So can, the matter's here before you again tonight. Uh, some of those people are here again tonight. Um, but tonight, those uh, comments, if they're made, they, won't go to, they will not uh, go unanswered. Uh, your police department, your jail is here to speak on its behalf to uh, give a little bit of balance and maybe a whole lot of reality to that conversation. Uh, the reality is that your city operates the finest facility in the nation. Programs and services that cannot be found at any other facility <clears throat> in the country. Uh, contrary to what others might say, this agreement raises that bar even higher. It provides even more programs, more services, and more protections for all civil detainees, especially the most vulnerable in the LGBT community that we have in our facility. We have a chance to take what is already the best in the nation, make it even better for everyone. Uh, the agreement, the TCCC, didn't just happen. It represents, you know, almost a year's worth of work uh, for three particular individuals, our jail administrator, our city manager, our chief of police, all together. Um, our jail administrator, she's more than just a subject matter expert. She's actually a, a legitimate caring person who is in daily contact, literally, with advocacy groups in the area to make sure our facility remains at the forefront. Uh, the chief of police was your handpicked choice to lead the safety of the city. The city manager was your handpicked choice to lead us to stability and success again as a city. Um, this is the TCCC is the program they worked on for a year. They went to Washington, D.C. multiple times to lobby the government to make sure that this agreement had everything the city needed it to have, and it does. There was other options on the board tonight. Um, those are the plan Bs. Those are the good enough options. Those are the what should we do because the initial uh, recommendation uh, was rejected. Um, I think we've all been here for a, a long time and we've seen what good enough gets this city and gets us in a whole lot of trouble. Um, the TCCC is the option that the jail administrator, the chief of police, and the city manager worked on personally, lobbied on to Washington, D.C., and that was their initial recommendation for what the city needs, and that's what I'm uh, suggesting that you guys approve to uh, pursue tonight. Thank you, Mr. Willard. Cool. Uh, next is uh, Jaime Manriquez, followed by Felice Hernandez. Good evening, members of the City Council. Mayor Polito is not here. City Manager David Cavazos, thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. My name is Jaime Manriquez. I was born and raised in the city of Santa Ana as well. Attended Spurgeon Intermediate, Santa Ana High School, Santa Ana College. Been here a very long time, very proud of this city. One of my goals has always been to give back to the community. And in 1998, when I applied as a correctional officer for the Santa Ana Police Department, I did so based on the core values of the mission statement of that department. Now as a correctional supervisor, I inspired all my staff 
to treat every person they come in contact with with those same values. But tonight I'm here to speak on behalf of my fellow correctional officers because we feel we've been portrayed or we've been, or you've been given a one-sided picture or story of how we operate our jail. Some of the recent comments that were made about our jail practices are inaccurate and not true. We take pride in our work, providing a safe and secure environment for our inmates and detainees. Our liability losses for the city have been minimal and not indicative of the broken system being portrayed. We do our very best to treat every person in our jail with dignity and respect. We provide our inmates, detainees, with medical treatment, dental, programs, they have psychological counseling, GED courses, and a variety of educational developmental courses. Throughout my career at the Santa Jail, I've heard many inmates praise our officers for feeling safe, especially from the places they've come from, other facilities. They feel that the IPC, interpersonal communication that we use by being in the module with them at all times, makes it very approachable for them to talk to them. Tonight, we would like City Council to revisit the ICE contract modification so we can continue to provide expanded services such as the TCCC. We believe that rejecting the modification will further displace detainees from this community as they will be displaced throughout the country to other facilities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Yes. Ms. Hernandez, the floor is yours with all the applause. Thank you. <laughs> I am, my name is Felice Hernandez, and I'm actually here to support the Santa Ana Jail and its continued operation in our city. I've been a professional counselor for 16 years. 12 of them have been at the Santa Ana Jail. We provide one-on-one -on -one ongoing counseling to individuals that for the most part have never participated, been offered, or even have reached out for any type of counseling services before. However, here at the Santa Ana Jail, the, mass, the vast majority of individuals that I see are now self-referring. Many of our inmates and detainees also advise that they regularly speak to their officers about personal issues, family, etc., and that the officers are not only respectful, they're helpful, and they're genuinely listening to their concerns. Counseling and educational services are an integral part of stopping recidivism, providing a platform for the individual to regroup and address some of the issues that follow them in life. Being lost in a system is a terrible place to be. Feeling helpless but desperate at the same time to change the path your life is on. Knowing something needs to change but not knowing how and where to take that first step. This facility is truly unique in the fact that the individuals are offered the support needed to start on this path. The fact that this is a smaller facility, it affords us the opportunity to really counsel individuals on a more consistent one-on-one -on -one basis. Easing the transition back into society is something that we can't overlook. Over the years, I've been told time and time again by the individuals, namely in the LGBTI community, that this is the first facility that they feel truly safe in. That the climate of this facility is very different. Individuals feel supported and they have communicated to me in particular that they don't live in constant fear that they, ought, they often feel in other facilities due to their race, gender, lifestyle, or identification. Not having to look over their shoulders at every moment is a much needed break, allowing them to focus not only on themselves, but not on the chaos that's always around them. Feeling safe and comfortable enough to open up about their past and work on ongoing issues behaviors and concerns is something that not many individuals have experienced. I've been to weddings, multiple graduations, and I've assisted several of our prior detainees and inmates on finding the resources they're going to need when they transition back into society. Jail is never a first choice for anyone. However, given the right type of environment, it can be that much needed pit stop that they need in order to get the help that they deserve. For the reasons stated above, I truly believe in the rehabilitation efforts provided by the City of Santa Ana Jail. And I leave you with a quote from a letter that I received in November 2012. 
And so today I won't leave it in my head. Thank you so much for reminding me of my life and goals ahead. I truly, truly believe in counseling efforts, and the city of Santa Ana Jail really provides that for all the detainees and inmates. And I really see how it has helped. Thank you, Ms. Okay. Hernandez. <laughs> Michael Elgin, followed by Luis Martinez. Followed by Charles uh, Goldwasser. Um, thank you for letting me speak tonight. Uh, my name is Michael Elgin. I'm a, been a teacher for 15 years. The last two of them have been at Santa Ana College teaching at the Santa Ana Jail. And um, it's a little roundabout. I'll try to beat that timer though. Um, I have been to um, my 15 years at least 30 or 40 different graduations um, for different classes I've taught. And none of the, my experiences teaching have ever touched me quite as much as my experiences at Santa Ana Jail. Um, before I came to work at Santa Ana Jail as a G instructor, my views of jails are generally were largely colored by my brother's experience. The jail he was in, uh, incarcerated in was more of the medieval type. It was a place of iron bars and indirect observation. Interaction with staff rarely boded well for the inmates. He was largely treated like an animal, and to this day, he still feels like one. Santa Ana Jail is a completely different kind of institution. Where my brother's experience was that of incarceration with little or no attention paid to um, how the, who the person would be upon release into the real world. Uh, sorry. Uh, Santa Ana Jail's philosophy and practices encourage rehabilitation, which I find is a much nobler, if often more difficult, challenge. Inmates interact directly with each other and the mod officers. They do so as people. The officer implement relationship is based upon respect, not fear. These officers truly are a, a new breed. The officers in the jail encourage inmates to develop themselves. Breaking barriers, ESL, GED, and computer classes provide inmates with opportunities for growth and acquisition of new skills they will need in their life ahead, and often of self-confidence. I teach GED. I am proud to be part of the jail's legacy and provide education to those who need it most. In the 18 years of, of the program, inmates have earned over 700 GED certificates averaging about 40 a year. In my first year at the jail, I was blessed to watch 24 students in the fall walk in an actual graduation ceremony held by the jail staff. The pride that showed in the, the, the faces of my students in this day, men and women who often cannot raise their head to, uh, in reaction to their past, uh, stunned me. My students and the students of uh, my fellow teachers are constantly looking to better themselves. The staff are wonderful at helping them do this. They push them to go to class. They push them to behave in class. They push them to realize that they are people, that they can be more than who they were when they came in. And I don't wish to see this in. The way that this jail works it really is the best thing for the people who are there. Of all the bad options there are, this is the best good option for their future. Thank you, Mr. Thank Elgin. You. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Martinez, the floor is yours. How are you? Uh, members of the City Council, thank you for inviting us to uh, speak to you on behalf of the teachers and, and the counselors at the jail. My name is Luis Martinez and I am a uh, mental health specialist, substance abuse, and I've been uh, counseling, uh, doing counseling for the past 30 years and in the past 10 years as an instructor for Santa Ana College. I teach um, substance use classes, anger management classes, uh, parenting classes, and uh, mental health education classes there. I also provide 
individual counseling and group counseling to the inmates at the jail, uh, including the LGBT <coughs> inmates, uh, many who are monolingual. Our services are, are, are very important, as you, as you may know. They're essential to the inmates who are taking these classes on a voluntary basis. What I mean by that is that instead of them being out into, in the uh, day room, which they get free time, they'd rather come to the classes. My classes are, are very well attended on Friday evenings and all day Saturdays. Personally, um, I chose to teach at the Santa Ana Jail. I, I could teach at other institutions, but I choose to teach at Santa Ana Jail. Why? Because it's a professional environment there. The officers are friendly. They're very um, supportive of our services, okay? Uh, as a bilingual counselor, I, I, I see uh, inmates who ask for counseling on a voluntary basis because they're going through some crises. They're, they're being separated from their families. Many, like I said, are monolingual. So the services that I provide for them are in, invaluable. They get a lot out of them. And they tell me, they tell me that uh, they'd rather be there in, as opposed to be in other places where they've had, uh, you know, difficult treatment. We also provide them with uh, much needed resources. So when they get out of jail, when they transition back where they go, where they go into, they know how to navigate the community. They know where to go get treatment, uh, much needed health, uh, medical and health and mental health treatment. And uh, I would just like ask for you to consider continuing the services there at the San Ana City Jail. Okay, they, they're, they're, uh, the inmates get a lot out of the classes, they get out of the sessions, and they uh, go back into the community. And I saw some of them today, earlier today, and all they could say is thank you for the services that we provided with them at, at the jail. Thank, thank you, you, Mr. Please, Martinez. Sir. Thank you very much. You're next, Mr. Goldwasser. I just wanted to make sure that Cecilia Garcia and uh, Adrian Silva are next. The Thank you, Mayor yours. Pro Tem, members of the council. My name is Charles Goldwasser. I'm the attorney for the Santa Ana Police Officers Association. Uh, we represent the about 80 people who work in the jail. They are part of our bargaining unit. Um, we uh, saw seem, seem to have a bunch of them here tonight to, for you to see them. Uh, I had the opportunity, oh, and there'll be other people who will tell you about the jail, and I'm, I'm sure that most of you have toured the jail. You've seen what it is. You've seen that it is a clean jail. It's well run. There are, there, there, there are programs, and you will understand that stuff, and that will be explained by others. I had the opportunity to look at the February 2nd uh, video of your meeting. We're here tonight to ask you to revisit some of your actions that you took on February 2nd. At that meeting, people were talking to you about some very principled positions and principled arguments. However, those principles are not necessarily ones for the city of Santa Ana to adjust in, in, the, in, the, in the final analysis. In other words, if people don't believe that people should be detained, the city of Santa Ana really can't make that decision. That's a decision that's dealt with by the federal government. You may want to take a position and be principled, but the fact of the matter is that as a, practical, as a practical matter, if this jail is closed, then the people, that doesn't mean people won't be detained in the future. They will continue to be detained, except they're going to be placed in worse conditions. They're going to be placed in bad jails, and they're going to be placed at, all over the country. So while here, you have the opportunity for people who have family, friends, network, support network, etc., to be close and can visit, when uh, when these detainees are in Missouri or Kansas or North Dakota, that won't be that won't be able to happen. It seemed to me that the uh, the council was moved by the principled arguments, and I believe that principles are important. However, this is a case where the principles are somewhat misguided in what they ultimately produce. 
They are not as beneficial to the detainees as one would hope or think. And what you're do, excuse me, what you're doing is you're taking a principled stand on the backs of our employees, of our members, on people who are born, raised in, in Santa Ana, live in Santa Ana, and people who have spent their lives. We, our, our employees are 15, 16, 17, 20 year employees. And th they're here to do a good job for you, to do a good job for the detainees, to do a good job for, for the citizens of Santa Ana. Would you please revisit your earlier decision? Would you please can make all of your decisions, keeping in mind the people who have done all the work here and will continue to do the work here? They are humans too. They have lives and families. Thank you, Thank Mr. Goldwasser. Ms. Garcia, uh, you're uh, uh, up now, and eight, followed by Adrian Silva, followed by John Franks. Hello, council members today. My name is Cecilia Garcia, and I have been a correction officer for the city of Santa Ana for approximately 15 years. I'm born and raised in the city of Santa Ana. I attended um, intermediate school and uh, high school here, Santa Ana High School. I'm very proud of that. Um, my parents have lived here since they first immigrated here. And um, I've, been, I've been resident here since then. Um, I'm here on behalf of my fellow correction officers just to inform you that um, the Santa Ana Jail is definitely doing a very good job in its um, mission statement and accomplishing its goals. I am, uh, obviously there are a lot of opinions and arguments as to the issue at hand. There are many negative rumors, misinformation, and propaganda concerning the jail's ongoing daily operations and treatment of immigrant detainees. As an employees, we are aware of the politics involved in such a sensitive subject. I am here simply to provide my humble and objective perspective as an employee. I can assure you that our facility is constantly adapting and changing according to the new immigration policies being implemented in the housing of these detainees, and we are constantly improving. We are receiving training in very specific needs of these detainees and learning about their, the unique population. Personally, I, fear, I feel we are in the forefront of training and implementation of ever-changing policies. As employees, we understand the importance of adaptation, and I assure you that we stay up to date and adjust to provide humane and professional care for these detainees. I invite you to look at the statistics of the Santa Ana Jail in comparison to other institutions for such a unique population, specifically the LGBTI population. We are one of the few institutions that have a specific housing unit dedicated to this population and their needs. Our staff receives ongoing training on how to provide the adequate housing and medical treatment that is necessary for them. We understand that the detainees are undergoing a process with immigration and we strive to ensure their well-being during this process. The fact is, whether they shut down the jail or not, these detainees will continue to be detained and undergo the process somewhere else, displaced away from their families, and maybe not under such advantageous conditions as we have at the Santa Ana Jail. Consider the repercussions of the impact such a decision will have on these detainees who have special needs. I am confident that our organization provides a safe housing environment for immigrant detainees and that we uphold utmost professional standards. Shutting us down will not make the immigration debacle in our city disappear. This issue will remain and I ask the council members along with everyone here present to have an open mind and be objective. You are not relocating and affecting the detainees but you are also changing the fate of city employees. Yes, this is a politically fueled agenda, but do not forget that there's a human factor on both sides of the coin. I trust that our board members will make the correct decision for everyone today. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to call up uh, Mr. Adrian Silva, followed by Mr. John Franks. Hello, Mayor, City Council, City Manager. Chief Rojas, my name is Adrian Silva. I'm a first gen generation American of Mex Mexican descent. My parents are from Juarez, Mexico. I've been an Orange County resident for over 16 years. I used to live in Washington Square for several years. I work here in the city and I often bring my family to shop at countless Santa Ana businesses along 4th Street, 17th Street, in virtually every one of your districts in one form or another. I come and see my vet and my pet groomer here. 
I get my vehicles fixed here. My kids often take summer classes here at OSHA or at the theater workshop on East Warner. They also play sports here in the city. Mr. Sarmiento, wherever you are, you might, remember, you might remember me because I had the privilege of coaching your son on a soccer team years ago. My kids volunteer here at St. Joseph's Church and my family and friends are here in Santa Ana. I love our city and I love the progress that I've personally seen here throughout the years. I'm part of the city and the city is part of me. It saddens me to see what's happening, to, to see the, the crime rate skyrocketing in front of our eyes with what seems like a just disjointed, political, correct response. There's nothing political about keeping our citizens safe. Crime is fought by putting criminal thugs in jail. It's sad to see the unraveling of all the good work that has been done over the past few decades, to see the dysfunction in the management of our institutions, the finger pointing and addressing the issues rather than cohesive work towards problem solving the problem at hand. Heaven forbid, there will be someone killed in this city from criminal, criminal violence sometime tonight or tomorrow night or during this weekend. The statistics show that that's what's going to happen. While looking for alternatives to our problems, one of the issues that we have is closing our jail. The public demands, the public demands that the jail be closed. What public are we talking about? The activists, the anarchists, the misguided that don't know any better because they've been fed a bunch of misinformation? Who are the true stakeholders? What about the residents, the ones that live in your districts? What about your public servants, many of whom, of whom have grown up here in the city of Santa Ana, many of whom have families here and come here for their needs just like me? What about the local businesses like the eateries and the, and the new shops and the established ones, the dry cleaners, the gas stations, those businesses in your districts that cater to the proud members of the Santa Thank Ana Police Department. Mr. Silva, if you could wrap up. Yes, sir. In short, sir, all the things that we saw today, the Kiwanis, the good work that you've, that you've done, the Kiwanis, the revitalization efforts that, that you've, you guys have, have worked so hard to do, um, everything that we've seen today, it's, it's all for naught if you let the criminal violence continue and if you close our jail. Thank you, Mr. Silva, and you're a great coach as well, so uh, I appreciate all the work you've done with my son. Uh, Mr. Franks, the floor is yours. Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem, Council, City Manager. Uh, my name is John Franks. I'm the President of the Santa Ana Police Officers Association. I'm here representing the, de representing the dedicated and hardworking correctional officers and supervisors that work in our city jail. For the last six years, our correctional staff and supervisors have had to work under the threat of uncertainty and job instability and yet they still maintain their professional attitude and continue to provide the quality service to the city and the inmates that are housed or that are booked on their way to the Orange County Jail. Clearly, as you can see, we stand united. It's not about immigration status or sexual orientation, but about hardworking city employees that have provided service to our city for the last 23 years. And it's clear based on staff recommendations, which we wholeheartedly disagree with, but regardless of what you guys decide, um, again, we stand here and we disagree with stack recommendations, that you keep these employees and their families in consideration. And I'm asking that the union leadership, SCIU, POA, um, the city manager, the police chief, and you guys, city council, um, that we all work together to ensure that no employee loses their job. Uh, one employee, one full-time employee uh, that loses their job is detrimental to the city and we've gone through this with animal control with parking control with SEIU jobs and uh, enough is enough we need to work together and and make sure that our employees do not lose their jobs and please be mindful when speaking and making any decisions in the future we still need to go back tomorrow and tonight to provide to go back to the same dangerous job and to, to provide the same high quality service that we've been doing for the last forever. And thank you. Thank you for the last five years um, of working with you guys and uh, I appreciate your guys' service. 
Thank you, John, and thank you for your leadership. We owe you a debt of gratitude for all your good work that you've done and that you continue to do. Uh, Michelle Monreal, followed by Roger Andrade, followed by Jorge Gutierrez. Thank you, City Council members and guests for this opportunity. I'm here in support of all the professional Santa Ana jail staff and in support of maintaining the jail. And to address uh, the two main points of contention that were addressed during the February meeting. The first one being the spurious allegations of the LGBT discrimination and the discrimination occurring in our facility of detainees in general. As an employee for the past eight years with the Santa Ana City Jail, I have personally supervised uh, the, the LGBT population and I can assure you that our staff goes above and beyond to ensure that their medical needs, their mental health, and their overall well-being is prioritized. We don't neglect their needs. We try to meet them as best as possible and as swiftly as possible. We have strict guidelines that guide our policy and practices. And if any of you have toured our facility, you see the way that we operate, the way that we interact with these individuals. We treat them with dignity. We treat them with respect uh, because we are made up of, a, of professional staff. Um, I myself am a mental health, I have a mental health background. And this is something that I um, hold near and dear to my heart to make sure that I treat everybody fairly and with equity, specifically these uh, underserved populations. Uh, the second point that I wanted to address is the incompatibility of housing these Latino immigrants in a predominantly Latino community. I grew up in the city. Uh, my parents were both immigrants to the city. Uh, I'm, I'm a product of Santana, and the way that I see it is it's a benefit for these individuals to have that proximity to their families, um, to the very strong support of these advocacy groups, um, and just a myriad of services uh, that really understands the detainee population, and just a, a culture overall that really understands their, their plight. Um, if they are relocated to another facility somewhere else throughout the country, as mentioned earlier, I mean, some, somewhere like Texas or the East Coast somewhere, are they going to have that strong support from the community? Are they going to have the same uh, treatment by the staff uh, as far as empathy is concerned? Uh, I, I, I doubt that. And I can guarantee you that if they... Um, remain at the Santa Ana City Jail, we will continue to maintain that very high standard and ensure that they're safe and that all of their needs are met. Thank you, Ms. Monreal. If you could wrap up or are you... Uh, sure. These were just two of the points that I felt compelled to address today. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for your words. Mr. Andrade, the floor is yours, followed by Jorge Gutierrez and An Angela uh, Pereira. Thank you very much, City Council, City Manager, Chamber members, citizens, and residents of Santa Ana. My name is Roger Andrade. In 1980, my family migrated to Santa Ana from Juarez, Chihuahua, Mexico. From the first day that my feet set foot on the city, my mother instilled in my sister and I that everybody had potential. Through her hard work, despite not being able to speak English, she was able to open up her own drapery business here in Santa Ana. And through the Reagan and George Bush amnesty program, I was able to naturalize myself as a citizen in the mid 90s. I'm a former illegal immigrant. I grew up in Santa Ana, I attended Lowell, Willard, uh, Wilson, and actually I went to school with uh, Councilman Reyna, former saint, 
Um, and I was fortunate enough to join the Santa Ana Police Department in 1992. During that time, there was a crime wave and Chief Paul Walters with uh, Jail Administrator Russ Davis uh, opened up a smaller facility. That smaller facility made it possible to open up the new police department in, in city jail. And when we opened up that facility, our department was at the forefront, not only locally, not only in the state, but also in the forefront in the country about community-oriented policing. And that was paired with a new style of jail supervision, which is direct supervision. Um, I'm very proud that I have been working for that jail for the last 24 years. As we have heard from other, some of my other peers and some of the other members, that this is one of the few uh, facilities, not only locally, but in the state, that is able to provide many of the programs that we have heard about tonight. Um, and I, I personally believe that at your last council meeting, you guys did not ha have that, that information. Um, so I really hope that you guys will reconsider uh, your position on this issue. Uh, for as other people have stated prior to me coming up here, uh, this facility is something special. It's something special, not just because it's in this city, but because of the potential, the potential that it has. And I understand that there are budgetary issues, issues that uh, have plagued us in the, in the last few years. But despite all those issues, all the employees, not only of, of the police officers union, but the other bargaining units have done bent over backwards to make sure that we were still able to provide the, the level of safety and of the highest standards. Uh, thank you, Mr. Andrade, if thank you, you could. Very thank, thank you very you. much for your testimony. And to everybody who spoke on behalf of uh, the family, the jail uh, uh, folks who are employed there, thank you for all your service. Um, Jorge Gutierrez, followed by Angela Pereira, followed by Cristina Lopez. Hi, my name is Jorge Gutierrez. I'm executive director of Familia Trans Queer Liberation Movement. We're a national and local LGBT Latino, Latino organization, and we've been working for the last three years here locally in Santana. I'm also proud of the Santana. Um, to, I think our goal as a community and, and the solution that we see for this um, issue is to get eyes out of Santa Ana completely. And we won't stop until we get that done um, here um, with your support or without your support. Um, so, um, and I think I just want to... I usually don't do this, but I feel like people need an, um, an educational history lesson right now. For those people that are standing here and saying how proud they are that they've grown up in Santana, let's not forget that we're, we're standing on stolen land from Native people and Mexican people. Um, and, and for these folks that have spoken before me and, um, you know, spitting lies about how perfect and how, uh, you know, high quality um, this um, facility is, then why do you have global ad advocacy organization like Human Rights Watch creating an almost 70 page report on all the abuse and discrimination that people are facing inside the San Ana Detention Center? Why do you have national organizations like the Transgender Law Center, Civic, ACLU, constantly putting out reports of how bad the conditions are? And you don't have to hear from reports either. You're going to hear from women, trans women that, that were inside themselves. You will hear from them directly what they went through. I just can't believe the lies that people are putting out in front of you. Um, and I think I just want to, I just want to end um, briefly because I think you, you, um, the women that were in there deserve the most, most of the time. But I think, again, you have such a huge, a remarkable opportunity right here, you know, city, um, council members, to actually respond in a way that's contradictory to what racist folks like Trump are putting out in our, in our country. That you actually can say this community, especially in a Latino community that's over 78%, 
um, to have a response and say, we are going to protect our folks, we're going to uh, uh, protect them and, and, and treat our people with dignity, and the only solution for our community. And city manager, at the meeting you said, tell us what you want us to do. And we're here to tell you that we want ICE out of Santana. We want the torture of trans women, to, the uh, violence to stop right now, and we won't stop until we get that done. And so um, I think, you know, um, it's, I'm just so, so, so angry, um, and I get it, and I get it, right, that folks, um, you know, are, are scared, right, and are here speaking about how good the facilities are scared because the truth has been found out, right, because people know what's going on inside the detention. I know they're also, right, so, and, and I know that they're scared, they're scared of losing their jobs, right, but not all jobs are good jobs. Thank you, Mr. Gutierrez. So uh, Ms. Pereira, followed by Christina Lopez, and I'm going to take a little, uh, if, my, if my colleagues will indulge me, I see uh, former Senator Lou Correa in the back, and I know he's been wanting to, to speak as well, so we'll give him the floor in a few minutes. So Ms. Pereira, please, the floor is yours. Hola, muy buenas tardes. Eh, disculpe un poquito con lo de mi voz, pero apenas eh, estoy, estoy un poco recuperándome porque tuve una operación porque tenía cáncer. Uh, good evening, my name is Angela Pereira. Um, uh, I'm sorry uh, because of my voice, but I'm recovering from a surgery I actually had, uh, recovering from cancer. Mi información de esta tarde que me siento muy indignada en saber que ninguna, ninguna de estas cárceles, ninguna de, de las prisiones, somos, somos, tenemos eh, una atención digna. I'm really upset uh, because all these jails, detention centers that we and you all, we all keep talking about, um, there's no such thing as dignity for us as trans mujeres. En todas las cárceles es lo mismo, que se les dificultan muchas las cosas. No nos atienden bien, no nos dan, no nos dan ni salud, no nos dan atención de todo, no que más bien se nos aísla. I mean, you can see it across. There's no, there's no dignity. There's no good services. There's no um, humanity, right? There's no recognition of our humanity as people in any of the jails across. Y por lo que he estado escuchando, las personas que están aquí presentes, no quizá no todas, pero lo que más les importa es que perder el trabajo y no darnos la oportunidad de salir adelante. And what worries me too is a lot of the people that uh, spoke before me uh, talked about their jobs and jobs, right? But they're not really talking or giving us the opportunity to free ourselves from detention from these cages. El día que el día que ellos sepan qué es realmente lo que nosotras necesitamos es el día que se, ellos pon, se pongan en nuestros zapatos y sepa y van a saber cuánto sufrimos y cuánto luchamos día con día. But the day they actually uh, try to be in our shoes uh, and really understand, fully understand what's happening to us while we are living inside these cages, these detention centers, hopefully they'll get to understand what we are going through. La comunidad transgénera no, no necesita cárcel, no necesita injusticia, lo que necesita es educación, trabajo y bienestar. The trans community does not need does not need detention uh, centers, does not need jails uh, or cages, right? What we need is education, we need support, we need mental health services, we need our dignity back. Y, y exijo a las personas, a, a las personas que están en, en todo este movimiento, que nos levantemos y pedimos también y exijo a las personas que cierren las detenciones porque nosotros no queremos más cárceles, no queremos más deportación y ni más injusticia. And I ask you all, uh, all of you here in the room, everyone, uh, to stand up and fight back. Uh, we want ICE out of uh, Santa Ana, we want ICE out of detention, we want no more jails, no more detention centers, not one more deportation. Thank you very Thank much. You. Christina Lopez, please. Followed by uh, Mr. Lou Correa, on deck. Buenas noches. Hi, good evening. 
Uh, disculpe por no traer nada escrito, pero yo creo que las personas más sinceras son las que se expresan así de frente y no tengo que estar escribiendo horas antes en mis escritorios tranquilamente. Uh, yeah, please forgive me, I don't have anything in writing. I'm going to be speaking from my heart, from my experience, and I, I strongly believe that you don't need to rehearse what you actually experience every day. Yo viví en esa detención por mucho tiempo y yo sé la homofobia que se vive dentro de esa detención. Algunos oficiales no están preparados y no lo van a estar porque no lo quieren hacer, no lo quieren, no quieren aceptar que existimos la gente transgénero. And I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience. I was actually locked up in Santa Ana for a long time. Uh, and I'm going to share a little bit about some of the officers inside there uh, that actually are not prepared, are not well trained and don't want to recognize our humanity. Ahora que estoy acá libre, quisiera que el oficial Molina me dijera, señor, yo sé que estás ahí, señor oficial. A ver, dígame, señor, ¿tú puedes decir? No soy señor. Uh, Cristina is saying that she would like to uh, ask Officer Molina, who is actually here in the room, to come forward and tell her, Mr. Right, um, which is what he called her uh, inside. This is what Molina called Cristina inside, and obviously she is not a man; she's a woman. Si sí, tanto dice la detención de Santana, um, hay gente que se preocupa por nosotras. Yo creo que no existe porque yo pasé dos años buscando medicinas para mi hígado y que nunca la recibí estando dentro de esa detención. For all of you saying that there's uh, health resources. Uh, health providers inside the jail. Um, I would like to see where that information is at because she spent two years uh, asking for uh, treatment for her liver and she never received it. Usted se imagina, señores, viviendo con una enfermedad, pudiendo hacer algo y que no le ayuden? ¿Usted vivirían tranquilos? ¿O qué pasaría si ustedes ven la oportunidad que hay de ayudar y no te lo dan, no te lo brindan? Uh, can you imagine you living with that pain every day, asking for that treatment, not getting it, even though it could have been easily provided for you, but they denied it to you? Ahora, ver el uniforme como lleva la oficial en la mera esquina, es, es recordar tristezas, dolor y, y, y coraje, porque en verdad estoy muy dolida y estoy traumada por haber estado allí. Disculpen algunos que, que si yo lo disculpen, pero en verdad estoy muy, muy dolida porque mi enfermedad ha seguido y no pudieron hacer nada por mí. And seeing the officer in the corner over there uh, reminds me of the painful experiences I experienced inside. It triggers a lot of the pain, a lot of the suffering that I experienced, especially with my illness, not receiving the proper treatment, and she does get a little emotional, and she, she would like to voice that. Señores, en sus manos está la decisión, yo creo que la más correcta, y mis compañeras de la detención deberían estar libres como yo. Gracias, gracias. So I would like to ask you to make that decision to end that uh, contract with ICE, and uh, we're asking, asking you to, to take action on behalf of the sisters inside. Thank you Lou Correa. Followed by Jessica Latona, followed by uh, Roberto Herrera. Lou Good evening, Council, here. Mr. Mayor, uh, citizens. Uh, first of all, I want to say my apologies for running a little bit late. I was at Santa Ana High School tonight. was a uh, welcoming freshman night at Santa Ana High School. It's great to see all those new parents and, and students. I understand earlier today you uh, congratulated and celebrated our Santa Ana High School wrestlers. I have two boys that wrestled at Santa Ana, one there now, and one just graduated, and it's good to see you recognize those young men and women. There you go. I like that, right? And by the way, there are two young ladies at Santa Ana High School that actually made the nationals this year on the wrestling team. So we're very proud that those uh, students are doing well. Uh, first of all, I want to say as a taxpayer in this city, I want to thank the council for your good work. And as a person who entrusts the safety of my family to the police officers of this great city, I thank the men in uniform for keeping my family safe. Uh, as you know, a couple of years ago, my wife was brutally attacked on the Santa Ana River while jogging, and it was our first responders that got there to take care of her, so I want to thank them very much for that. Today, I'm here primarily to, to address the issue of the federal contract with the city of Santa Ana. Santa Ana is a very diverse issue, and being such, this is a very sensitive issue for all of us living in Santa Ana. Uh, 
Please consider this issue very carefully. I know you will, but I ask you as you do so, as you study this issue, consider the needs of our community, protect all immigrants, especially the LGBT uh, immigrants, make sure you address their housing and other issues, um, make sure there's no layoffs as you address this issue from a fiscal perspective. Uh, make sure that our public safety officers throughout the city, that none are laid off, especially in this time when we have rising challenges, rising crime in our city. And make sure that your solution is prudent for the city of Santa Ana. And finally, let me say that, that as long as uh, at the federal level immigration reform is not addressed, this will continue to be an issue at the local level. Let's do the best we can. And I ask the city council, city government, to come up with a solution that's a win-win for everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Lou, for all your great work and your leadership, and uh, we wish you well. Thank you for those words. Jessica Latona, followed by Roberto Herrera. Uh, hola, buenas noches a todos y todas. Hi, good evening. Good evening, everyone. Okay, esta noche me siento como todos y todas mis compañeras indignada por el trato inhumano que se nos da dentro de la detención de Santa Ana Jair. Tonight I feel very frustrated, right, um, because of what's happening along with all my trans sisters, um, because we're still having this conversation about the Santa Ana City Jail. Para comenzar, quiero señalar a muchos de los oficiales que están acá, como por ejemplo Molina, Conde, Cobos y otros en particular, que también me gustaría que me trataran como él y no como ella. And tonight, I also would like to ask uh, the officers Molina, Conde, Conde Cobos, Cobos. Y Cobo, and Cobos to come forward and again and ask, I ask them, I would like to ask them to address me as Mr. as they did before. Y muchos de ellos, uh, no puedo decir sus apellidos porque no los recuerdo, pero sí los puedo señalar porque están acá presentes. And others, uh, I actually can recall their last names, but I do remember their faces and they're actually here tonight as well. En particular, estuvo un señor aquí presente diciendo que tenemos una educación. Claro, él puede decir que tenemos una educación, pero él no está con nosotras las 24 horas como lo, lo están los oficiales. Uh, and also someone that came forward here and spoke about education and resources and such. Uh, I, would like to, uh, I would like to tell this person that, yes, education, but you're not here with us as trans women 24 hours. Lo que yo pido ahora esta noche es que por favor tomen en conciencia y que la detención de Santa Ana ayer esté cerrada porque los oficiales que están aquí presentes no tienen la capacidad de interactuar con la comunidad trans con una identidad de género. And I would like to demand, I would like to ask for you all to shut down Santa Ana City Jail. All the officers that are supposedly here to keep us safe obviously cannot keep us safe. We as trans mujeres must be free. Uh, we deserve our dignity and our freedom. Estuve por casi siete meses dentro de este infierno en donde no se nos atiende. No tenemos una salud integral como ellos lo están diciendo acá. I was locked up for seven months in Santana City Jail, and it was like hell for me. I didn't have any proper um, resources, mental health uh, resources, um, uh, access to health, none of those resources that everyone claims uh, that are accessible inside, I didn't have any of that. Y es por eso que no me da miedo dar la cara por mi comunidad trans y la seguiré dando hasta la muerte. Muchísimas gracias. Gracias. And that's why I am no longer afraid to talk about my experience, uh, and I am here uh, representing my community as a trans woman. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Roberto Herrera. <laughs> followed by Jairo Cortez and Avila Medrano. Hello, city council members. My name is Roberto, and I am organizing on behalf of the Colores Queer Orange County. 
The city manager is seeking your authorization on the recommended actions to move forward and address how to get out of the jail business. These there are short-term and long-term strategies that need to take into account that need to take into account the various issues at play. These issues, therefore, by extension, these recommendations, we believe, are conflated by the city manager, which prolongs the ultimate goal of getting Santana out of the prison industrial complex and liberating vulnerable populations that the city of Santana has continuously profited from. The solution being proposed before you is to authorize the hiring of a $100,000 reuse consultant to research and help guide the city of Santana out of the jail business. We believe this proposal by the city manager stalls the process of getting ICE out of Santana. Much worse, it conflates the separate issues of doing away with the ICE contract and the other long-term goal of shutting down the facility. We feel the recommended action to authorize the reuse consultant can address the long-term goal, but what, queer and, what trans and queer people need is liberation now. <laughs> efforts, efforts to prolong the ICE contract doesn't do justice to the real-life trauma and violence faced by queer and trans people in detention. This state-sanctioned violence can't continue. Your commitment to end the Santana jail facility is not signaled by the hiring of a $100,000 consultant. Rather, it's utilizing the power you have now to initiate the 90-day termination clause that will put an end to ICE, put an end to trans and queer detention locally, and set precedent nationally. Last February, you listened to the community by agreeing to not extend the city's contract with ICE. Now, we urge you to immediately initiate the 90-day clause and get ICE out of Santana. Now is the time for you as city representatives to work for the people. We urge you to prioritize the humanity of trans women and queer migrants over profit. Do the right thing. Close the jail. Kick ICE out of Santana and start prioritizing human life rather than making them pay for the deficits you, the city, got yourselves into. <laughs> Failure to do so failure to do so will show that you as council members and representatives are much more concerned about money over the suffering of queer and trans folks that are escaping the harsh realities of persecution for their gender and sexual identities. Stop investing in prisons and start investing in the well-being and prosperity of Santana's residents. Some examples of this include addressing the city's problem with homelessness. What we need is compassion and investment in our youth and the overall prosperity of city, in the city we live in and call home. The ball's in your court. It's your turn to act. Initiate the 90-day termination clause now and put an end to trans and queer detention. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Herrera. <laughs> so uh, after Mr. Cortez and uh, Avila Medrano, we're going to take a short break to come back to our consent because we have a lot more speakers. Um, and that way we can take care of some business and get that out of the way as well. But Mr. Cortez, the floor is yours. Uh, good evening, uh, members of the council. I am here representing the Orange County Immigrant Youth United, an undocumented immigrant youth led organization that advocates for the rights of undocumented immigrants to live free from exploitation and persecution. Exploitation and persecution. I want you to consider these two words today because that is what we are discussing uh, when we boil the, the issue down. The city of Santana has been complicit in the, explo in the exploitation and persecution of undocumented immigrants as it entered its jail contract with ICE. We are here today because the time has arrived for you all to act. Over the years, this ask has been made of you, and over the years, we have been asked to wait. We have been told that there is a difficult financial situation. But today, the question is very clear. Is Santana a city that puts the, uh, that values profit over people? Is Santana a city that wants to be recognized and that wants to be known and wants to be acknowledged as a city that decided to, to make up for its bad financial judgment when it, when it built the jail, to make up for its bad uh, judgment when it entered into the, the contract with ICE on the back of transgender women, on the back of other immigrants? Now, contrary to what a lot of the people here have been saying, the people that are be and a lot of the transgender women that are being detained in this jail are not from Santa Ana. The same argument that they are making that if we close this jail down, they'll be sent from somewhere. Santa Ana is the place that they're being sent from places like Arizona, from places like Alabama, 
uh, from other places in the, in the country. So that argument is not really a strong argument to make this decision based off of. Now we're here to say that we've had enough. I urge you to end the contract with ICE. I, I urge you to, like Roberto, uh, to trigger the 90 days ca cancellation clause because the time has arrived and now we've, we took a very strong step in denying the expansion of immigrant detention in February. It's time to finish where we started. It's time to, um, to lead the country, not just by saying we're not going to take an expansion, but we're going to get out of the business altogether. We're dealing, we are in a very uh, difficult time for immigrant families. Now today, you, um, you, know, you commemorated, you honored people that uh, you know, volunteered at the last citizenship fair. But it doesn't need to stop there. We don't, we can't just value people based off their ability to vote. We can't just uh, imagine that that's the only contribution that people have to make. And so I urge you once again to trigger the 90 days cancellation clause and to, to lead the country by saying Santana is going to take a, a, a stand against detention, is going to take a stand against the, the detention, especially of transgender women, and we're going to say now one more deportation. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Cortez. <laughs> Ms. Medrano, you'll be the last speaker before we uh, recess to the consent calendar. Good evening. Uh, my name is Avila Medrano, and I'm here with Raiz. I am the community engagement advocate for Raiz. And let me start off with something. Let me make something very clear and very unapologetic. I'm an illegal immigrant. As an illegal immigrant, moving to Santana was my safe haven. After growing up in years of oppression in a state that clearly hates us, that clearly set laws to make sure that we stayed in the shadows, I felt that I had found safe haven in Santana. So why, why, are we, why are we discussing things that will take this safe haven for people like me away? For those employees that are working in these, in these facilities, let's face it, we see these people as criminals. We don't see them as human beings. For those employees who teach and make a difference, why don't you teach at our public schools and make a difference with our young kids here in Santana? Why don't we have community centers where these LGBTQ folks and former detainees can go to so that they can get the resources that they need? Where are these people that, that claim that being detained is good? Oh, that's right, they're detained. And I bet you that none of them know that they're being profited. Ms. That Medrano, they're being if you could back from. up from the speaker just to, or from the microphone just a little bit so we can hear you better. Thank you. Again, I bet you they don't know that, be, that their bodies are being used and being used as profits. Santana doesn't need to be recognized as the city who uses people's bodies to make a profit. This deficit that was created wasn't because of them. So why are they paying the price? Why is the LGBTQ community paying the price? You talk about families when we talk about losing jobs. When somebody's detained, we're affecting families, kids that go to Santana Unified School District. Why, if we're concerned so much about jobs, why don't we get better jobs that don't dehumanize communities? If we're gonna talk about killings, well, then the news, they burn a lot of killies, killings at the hands of police not at the hands of criminals. So with this said, I don't think that we should justify that having people in detention to make a profit, to fulfill a deficit that the city created, not people who are innocent, is not an excuse. We should start the 90-day phase out, and we should start it now, because again, like my, like my colleague said, we started this job in February, and we need to finish it. We need to finish it now. Thank you. So we're going to recess uh, item 65B, uh, Madam City Clerk, and we're going to move to the consent item and consent calendar and uh, uh, address those. I know that uh, we have some council members that had to leave the meeting and some others that aren't feeling well, so we're going to try to do as much business as we possibly can. So um, 
With that, I'll go ahead and bring our attention to the consent calendar and uh, ask my colleagues if there's any uh, matters that they'd like to have pulled. Um, Jeff, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, uh, three items that I hope you can address very uh, briefly, 19F, 25D, and 31C. I didn't catch the last one, uh, Council Member. 31C. 31C? Um, yes, 31C. 19F, 25D, 31C. Correct. Uh, any others? The only one I uh, would like to pull is 25C, as in cat. And uh, 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 Madam City Clerk, items 11A, 20A, 20B, and 20C, I'd like to move to continue. Uh, three of those require a five-person vote and uh, majority, and we only have four up here. So. Um, with that, I'll go ahead and, uh, uh, first of all, um, ask for a vote on the uh, four matters to be continued. I'll entertain a motion. So moved. All those in favor? Aye. Okay. Motion carries. Uh, and the first item would be 19F, and I believe that's yours, Council Member Ben uh, uh, Yes. Uh, Mayor Pertem, I'd like to uh, move this item with comment. We have a... Uh, as part of the, the opportunity we have as council members uh, to appoint and engage members of the community, uh, leaders in the community, we have a youth commission and in this, in this current fiscal year, council uh, set aside uh, some funds, I believe maybe for the first time or for the first time in a long time for the youth commissioners to uh, work together to come up with uh, projects that would benefit the, the broader community, the youth and the broader community in the city. Uh, the youth commissioners serve an advisory capacity to the council, and one of the items that they uh, this this uh, they have an initiative, the bike helmet art initiative that they are uh, that they have designed and that they're they're rolling out to uh, promote bike safety throughout the city. And I just want to commend our, our commissioners and ask our staff to to uh, send that message back to the commissioners that we appreciate the work that they're doing, uh, their leadership. Uh, and the efforts that they're uh, taking uh, to, uh, pr again, promote safety within the community. A lot of our, of our community, not only our youth, but our, our adults also uh, use bikes uh, as a form of, of primary, tra primary form of tra transportation out of, out of a need, necessity, and uh, appreciate our youth uh, and uh, youth commissioners and their leadership. So, again, just wanted to make that comment and encourage staff to get that message out there and continue to support and work with uh, our uh, youth commissioners. And with that, I'll, again, uh, move the item. Thank you, Council Member. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Moving on to 25C, and that's the matter that I requested to, to have pulled. Uh, Mr. City Manager, I think we, um, I'd actually like to continue this matter just because right now my uh, position is to not support, and I know that there being only four of us, I think it requires a more robust discussion, and so I would request uh, that. Uh, we, we, uh, is this the animal shelter? We, if we don't give them a yes, um, uh, by uh, this month, we won't be able to participate in the agreement. And, uh, and un unfortunately, we don't have any options for an animal shelter. So I, I, I don't know if you want to think that over a little bit or maybe uh, give us, uh, but unfortunately, uh, we, we wouldn't uh, be so able to. So it's a time sensitive matter. We need, yeah, to, I we need to make a that. decision I, today. Or not. So we need all four votes, and I, I hope that you can reconsider your your position. Okay. Um, well, let me open it up to my colleagues if there's any questions or comments on that. The, the amount of comment is that, uh, Councilman. It, it seems like we're somewhat in a in in a kind of catch twenty two of, of sorts. There is a. a a need that we have to be able to provide adequate service, uh, animal shelter service uh, for our city, our residents, ultimately the, the uh, animals within the city. We at one point operated our own shelter that we found was not necessarily uh, you know, the, the best uh, type of business for the city to be in for a number of reasons, the cost, the, the conditions, and we ended up contracting with the county for those reasons. Uh, at this point, that shelter, the current shelter the county has is also uh, in a place where it's not necessarily the most uh, uh, the, the, the prime or, or, or best uh, type of situation. That's why they're taking action now to be able to uh, create and provide 
uh, service that is uh, better quality by design by, by building it uh, a shelter altogether. My question to staff is: If we don't, what are our options? If we choose not to participate, uh, and uh, and the other is the the funding that we are being uh, that's being proposed or, or being recommended for from staff or council to to allocate. How are we going to? Uh, fund and, and take care of this, uh, uh, the, the amount of funds that are presented here in the agenda. Thank you, uh, uh, Councilmember ben, uh, Benavides. We uh, looked at a lot of different options. Uh, the uh, site is available in Tustin. The, the county's uh, going to uh, go ahead and do a land swap. They're putting in the first $5 million. We do have the ability to, to make the payments over 10 years. There's a city manager uh, group to assure uh, that they have a quality project. This is in response to some of the concerns. I do want to emphasize to the mayor pro tem that the, uh, I believe that the director of the animal shelter is here. And if you want to ask a couple of pointed questions, could we have him come up, uh, Chief? I'm good, Mr. City Manager. Oh, you're Actually, good. okay. Just want to make sure. Look, I, well, uh, uh, Council Member Benavides, are you? Uh, do you have any further comments? But the, the, to answer the question more directly, we. We don't have any options. Uh, we did have, as you know, the, the shelter many years ago. We discontinued it. We contracted with the county. Uh, the police chief has told me our experience has been good. Um, the vast majority of the other cities have, uh, are also in agreement. And uh, we believe that uh, this, this contract, while not perfect, would be in the best interest of the city of Santa Ana. As far as funding, Mr. City Manager, uh, the, the, our portion. Uh, the, the, the portion, thank that. you. The portion is directly related to the usage, uh, and it would be adjusted, of course, uh, as the usage goes up or down. Uh, but we would make a commitment on our pro rata share of the expenses, both for the capital and the operating expenses. Thank you. Uh, again, given given the situation we've been in the past, the analysis that, that, that staff has gone through, I've met and, and discussed with the police chief uh, on, on several occasions, uh, the situation and, and the need. I'm, I'm ready tonight to go ahead and move the, uh, the item on the agenda. Is that a motion? Motion, motion yes. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. My brief comment is, is that um, I do have some reluctance on this item because I know I've spoken about some concern with the way the county has operated some of its agencies. Their employees and their staff are very good, especially their environmental health agency. I, I can't speak highly enough about them. Unfortunately, some of the leadership at the board has me concerned. Um, the terms of this agreement, because this, this is sort of a mutual aid, mutual benefit agreement, we're paying into this. It's going to be operated by county staff. Does the council or any of the other cities that are paying in, do they have any comment? Can they opine on the treatment and the condition of the animals that are being housed? Yes, uh, there is a, uh, a committee that's been put together. The uh, City Managers Association, which I'm a member of, uh, we meet monthly. We've been working very closely with the county. And so there, there have been some assurances regarding the treatment and how the, uh, the uh, county is going to manage this. And obviously, at the end of the day, uh, there, are, there are some provisions uh, with regard to that. And also, um, if, if uh, the conditions become unsatisfactory, we wouldn't want to do it. But there's always the option of, of withdrawing from the, from, the, from the county participation. Thank you, Mr. City Manager. With that uh, safety net uh, uh, clause in there, I think I will be prepared to support this as well. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed, motion carries. Moving on to 25D, and I believe that's yours, Council Member Benavides. Uh, uh, yes, Mayor Pertem, thank you. 25D, uh, this item is a uh, community branding. Uh, how do we worded it? Your community branding marketing uh, services for the city. It's something that we've been uh, discussing for, for quite some time uh, that the, the opportunity that we have, there's a lot going for the city of Santana, uh, unfortunately for, for many years. Uh, the story of the city, the rich history, the opportunity, the, the, the unique uh, offerings of our community uh, have been in a lot of ways kind of overshadowed and the story has been told for us and, and oftentimes it hasn't necessarily been the most positive story that has been conveyed out there, not, not that the full accurate uh, narrative of, of the, the richness and opportunity that is here in, in, uh, in Santa Ana. So I am uh, uh, very glad that we're having this, this item, uh, this opportunity as a city, as a council to allocate funds to 
uh, bring one of the top agencies in the country on, on uh, community branding to be able to uh, correct and, and change the narrative. Uh, you know, last week uh, or a few days ago, there was a, a media summit that uh, was held here, and I was uh, hoping to be able to make it, but was uh, not, not feeling well, didn't get a chance to, to be there. But I know one of the, the main things and that the themes was, was changing narr the narrative uh, and actually, I think maybe more correcting the narrative into, again, uh, the, the, uh, the beauty that is uh, this community. And so uh, I, I will be uh, supporting this item. I'm very much looking forward to uh, working with uh, uh, North Star, which is the, the uh, agency that's being recommended by staff who went through the, uh, the RFQ process. And I look forward to uh, the process itself, engaging the community, uh, and then the, the outcomes uh, more, more than anything. Uh, to again brand uh, the city for all of its of, of its richness and it and what it has to offer, I think it'll be able to instill a lot of community pride and ultimately economic benefit as well to our to our community. So with that, I'm, I'm moving the item. Thank you. Is there a second? Seeing no further comment, there's a motion and a second. Thank you, by the way, Councilmember Benavides, for your leadership on this. I know you've you fought long and hard for this. So uh, that being said, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Moving on to 31C, which is the final item on consent. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. This is a, an item where conditional use permit is being uh, requested of Council for use of uh, Central Baptist Church at the corner of uh, of guard, of. Uh, Grand and, and uh, Santa Clara. And uh, w one of the things, we, we have received some correspondence with regard to uh, this, uh, this, this application or this, this item on the agenda. Um, and more than anything, I know staff has gone through. There, there is a, a variance on uh, some of the landscape. Uh, there is also, uh, I, I was by, went by the, the property, and, and there is some, uh, there isn't the largest uh, 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 parking lot there av available. The, the reason I wanted to bring this, uh, pull this item and, and just make some comment. I will be, uh, I, I'm one that, that uh, is, will be the first to encourage and partner and support the, the partnerships within this, the city and the faith community and churches in particular. Uh, but I also, uh, being a, a member of, of a church for, for years and recognize also that, that uh, it's also imperative that churches make good neighbors and, and, and partners with the community as well and, and look for any and every way for them to be able to, to bring an added value to, where, or to their community, where they will be located. Uh, in this case, we're being asked to, to make some concessions. Uh, the property currently is not in the, the best of shapes. Uh, I, I just want to encourage staff, and really, I don't know if we do have any representatives uh, tonight, but we, if we can convey this, this message uh, to them is that uh, I, I would hope that, especially being being a church, that the, the standard would be raised, that they would be very intentional about uh, making the upkeep uh, or, or the upgrades that have been that have been referenced within the uh, uh, the, the, the staff report here, uh, both in, in landscape, uh, the facility itself, the facade. That they would be uh, good neighbors. Oftentimes, what we hear is that uh, during times when there's larger gatherings, there's spillover on parking and all. Uh, so I just want to make sure that they are, again, uh, uh, just held to a standard where they're good neighbors. And, and hopefully if they, they get the, either they're here or they get the, this message, there, is a, 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 there are several schools right in that immediate area, an, an, uh, an intermediate school. And uh, one of the opportunities I think a lot of our churches have that, that uh, uh, sometimes they may not necessarily... Uh, uh, well, I hope more and more churches will see themselves as community centers, that during the week, oftentimes midweek, there is not too much activity there. There's a lot of activity on the weekends, on Sundays, uh, and it would be a wonderful thing for every, every, community, every church to be able to see themselves as an asset in a community uh, center, opening up their doors to, to the, the youth uh, during the week uh, that might walk by their facility. So uh, just some of the uh, uh, comments and, and, and hoping that... Uh, that they will uh, respond by, by doing that. Cities, uh, imagine if we pass this item, we'll be providing some concessions that they will uh, truly reinvest and, and see themselves as, a, as an asset and, and serve our, 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 the surrounding community uh, there. So with that, I'll be uh, moving the item. Thank you. Is there a second? We have a motion by Benavides, a second by Reina. There's a pattern here. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed, motion carries. 
Uh, now I'd like to entertain a motion for the balance of the consent calendar. So moved. Motion in a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Uh, Madam City Attorney, I'd, uh, are there any items for you to report out from closed session? Yes, um, Mayor Pro Tem and members of the council, we do have a few reportable actions. Um, with the, in the first matter of Johnny Quijas, the City Council approved on a 4 to 0 vote $132,471 settlement with uh, Mayor Polito, Council Member Martinez, Council Member Tina Harrow, and Benavides voting yes for that. We also had another settlement in the matter of Gerald Amende on a 5-0 to zero vote. Uh, Martinez, Sarmiento, Tina Harrow, Benavides, and Mayor Polito voting to approve a settlement of $215,000. With respect to the item on 1901 First Street, the City Council authorized on a unanimous vote of entering into a tolling agreement, and that is all the reportable action that I have. Thank you, Madam City Attorney. I believe we only have one other matter on the calendar before we go back to 65B, because if I'm not mistaken, Madam City Clerk, we don't have quorum to address any of the public hearings that are on the agenda. So let me, uh, let me uh, move forward with 55B, and that is the resolution authorizing the submission of applications for Cal Recycle Payment Program funds. Uh, move the item. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion by Benavides, second by Tina Hedo. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. 65A we've already taken care of. 65B is in recess. 75A, uh, Madam City Attorney, is a public hearing and we do not have quorum. How do we handle that? Uh, we can't continue it. Does it just go off? Well, you have a quorum of the City Council to vote on it. Um, you don't need, I don't believe that requires five votes. Yes, it does. For a public hearing? Right. It's it's a condemnation issue. I'm sorry, it's a condemnation. I'm, I'm thinking ahead on 75B. I'm on a different matter. You're right. The condemnation does require a supermajority vote. So how does it, does it get continued automatically? Do we move the item? Do we take any action? My recommendation would be that you open the public hearing at least and just open it for purposes of continuing it so we can post its continuance and then we won't have to re-notice it. Very good. So this is the time and place for a public hearing to consider authorizing condemnation of real property at 1607 North Bristol for the Bristol Street improvements. Uh, the Public Works Director is available to answer questions. Uh, I will open the uh, public hearing. Uh, are there any members of the public that wish to speak on this item? Seeing none, Madam City uh, Attorney, do we close that? or Close do it and just continue it to the next meeting, which would Understood. be Understood. I will close the public hearing and I will entertain a motion to continue the matter. So moved. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Motion carries, and I believe uh, we're on to 75B, and we'll do the same thing. I'll go ahead and uh, 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 open the matter on the public hearing to consider adoption of a proactive uh, rental enforcement program, the PREP ordinance in Chapter 8, and I believe the Planning and Building Director is available to answer any questions. So I will now open the uh, uh, public hearing, Madam C uh, City Clerk, have we received any uh, written communications? The communication has been received and circulated to the council. It's also been entered into the record. Very good. Thank you. And we have one speaker on this uh, item, and that is Mr. Ray Maggie. Are you uh, with us, Mr. Maggie? Thank you, sir. Uh, the floor is yours. Good evening. Uh, my name is Ray Maggie. I'm the past president of the Apartment Association of Orange County statewide, etc. Manage 160 low and moderate income units in the city, which are not affected by the PrEP program because they're, they're all gold sealed. Uh, I've been one of the founding members of this PrEP program, and I never thought after 22 years that I'd have to be in front of this council because we always had the PrEP program approved and settled. This time the budget was approved, and all of a sudden somebody came up with a new uh, program. And I think that it's like have, we asked it to be continued, and I've given you a written uh, description of the whole program. Uh, I would support a continuation, and then we can work it out the problems. It's going to be continued no matter what. I we know. don't we don't have a quorum okay. to address and the great. matter. Great, I'd love so. to work with the other whoever the staff person that added these two items that affect low and moderate income people. I would like to sit down with Mr. Maggi. I, I see that I see the city manager's head so nodding we, uh, and the we, director's we, head we, nodding. So yeah, maybe Hassan can get a card. Thank, Thank you, you so Mr. Much. Maggi. Please uh, work with Mr. Hassan, and uh, we'll, get, we'll get there for you. So seeing no other uh, members of the public to speak, I'll close the, close the hearing and entertain a motion to continue the matter. Thank you very Make much. Make a motion to continue the item. So, second. 
All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. The matter is continued. Uh, we already took uh, 75C has been already addressed, and we're at 75D. And this one has been, there's been a request by staff to continue the matter. Do we need to open it, or do, uh, Madam City Attorney, do we just go ahead and just move forward with the continuance as recommended by staff? You can go ahead and continue that one. Okay. I'll entertain a motion to uh, continue. So move. Okay, we have a motion and a second to continue. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. That takes us to our work study session. We can defer that till later, and let's get, get back to 65B, uh, and we'll readjourn on that. And hopefully we can hold up for a little while on this one. And the next speaker is Lupita Rolón, followed by Fabiola Avila. Um, my name is Lupita Rolón. Uh, I came with the organization of OCIYU. I live in Orange, but I'm here because I believe that the ISDO contract is wrong because it's people like me that are in there, and it's more important to put the people first than money. And also for trans women's safety, the solution for them is not detention. It should be freedom. So I'm asking you to end the jail contract with the ICE immediately. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Fabiola Avila, followed by Jonathan Brubieska. Hello, Santa Ana City Council. My name is Fabiola Jacob Avila. I am the Deportation Defense Organizer uh, with Orange County Immigrant Youth United. Um, and we do a lot of work countywide and here in the city of Santa Ana. Um, I am not, I currently do not live in the city of Santa Ana. Out of all places, I live in unincorporated Orange County, which is where all the fires happen. Um, I do, however, go to school here uh, in Santa Ana City College, Santa Ana College. Um, I am a student at the Pathway to Law School program. Um, my job allows me to do, uh, and the volunteer work that I do allows me to have a lot of contact with the folks that are inside um, of these jails and these detention centers. Um, they are, uh, these are places that, you know, suck the life out of you. you. You see people in pictures the way they look before they come into these places, and then you see them inside and they're completely different. Now the reason why I'm saying this is yes, a lot of the folks, you know, that spoke before, um, a lot of the immigrant rights organizations, uh, groups, or the people that have been doing public comments that talk about you know, yeah, they're being processed by immigration, um, but they are being treated and they are being in contact with the staff uh, all the time. And so the way that someone is treated, um, you know, physically, mentally, psychologically, um, makes a really big difference uh, in the way, in, in their well being. So, yes, they are in immigration proceedings. Um, there shouldn't be detention. There shouldn't be a lot of uh, tearing families apart. And I want to address that specifically. Um, we do work with them inside. We do see them. And yes, they are in immigration proceedings. We hear you, uh, city employees. However, they're not being treated right. Um, and if they were, we wouldn't have trans women here talking about their experiences. They're really, really bad experiences inside of a detention center. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jonathan uh, Bribieska, followed by Pat Coyle, followed by Laura Cantor. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jonathan Bribieska. I am the statewide coordinator for the California Immigrant Youth Justice Alliance. Uh, the alliance is an alliance composed of 13 immigrant youth groups across the state. Uh, today, some of those uh, immigrant youth groups spoke in Sacramento in support of uh, uh, AB 1289. Uh, SB 1289, a Dignity Not Detention Bill. This, this legislation seeks to end private detention centers in California. This legislation seeks to end the private business of making money out of people's suffering. This legislation seeks for California to lead the way as it has in terms of immigrant rights. And uh, although this was going on in Sacramento, uh, immigrant youth across the state is paying attention tonight to the city of Santana. 
The city of Santana has the opportunity to send an unprecedented message across the state and across the country that you will no longer justify financial need of our people's lives, that we will push DHS to implement alternatives to detention. We will send a message across the country that the city of Santana will stand against anti-immigrant xenophobic rhetoric by ending the detention business of our queer and trans undocumented immigrant community. We want the city of Santana to issue a cancellation notice st stating the end of ICE and jail contract. Lead the way and get out, get out of the jail business. Thank you. Thank you, Pat Coyle, followed by Laura Cantor. Thank you, Ms. Coyle. Thank you. Honorable Mayor and remaining council members, my name is Pat Coyle. I am one of the instructors at the jail, and I chose to teach there on purpose. I do believe that change is possible. I believe that people deserve opportunities. I believe they deserve chances. They deserve information. And I want to give that to them to the best of my ability. The other instructors have the same attitudes. They forgot to mention we have music classes, we have computer classes, we have um, the GED program. I also teach a class called Breaking Barriers. It's about goal setting, affirmations, making changes, comfort zone. And one of the most important lessons I teach is about learning styles. And with learning styles, the most common comment I get is, you mean I'm not stupid? No, they're not stupid and I'm there to help in any way I can. I'm very sad by what I hear here. I wish that all the problems that have been brought up could be solved by closing a jail. It's not gonna solve the problems. They're gonna go elsewhere. And I'm concerned that these people, my people, my students be treated with dignity. And I choose to teach where I am, not in the community, because I wanna be part of making it better for them if possible. They deserve it. I'm saddened that people are mistreated. I'm saddened that no program is perfect and no facility is perfect. But I've been in many of them. In a former career, I worked in corrections. And I know that this is one of the most humane facilities I've ever been into. And I would not want to be a teacher elsewhere. I know it's not perfect, nothing is. But in my, I've been there since 2000. In my time there, the jail does try to accommodate people, it does try to uh, meet the needs of all the populations. There are many populations. I have students in my ESL class who've never been to school in their life. They don't speak a language that we have interpreters for, and they've never held a pencil in their hand. And they have the courage to come to class for the first time in their life. And I have other students who are doctors from other countries, and they don't speak English. So it's a wide variety of problems, a wide variety of needs. and. Um, of all the facilities I've seen, this one tries to meet that, and I'm concerned about what happens to the people if they don't get help or programs or things that can make life better for them. And I feel that Santa Ana Jail isn't perfect, but it's one that tries to do that, and I've seen that over the years. Again, I wish it would solve problems to close the jail, but I don't see that solving the problems, but I wish they could be. Thank, Thank you. you, Ms. Cole. Ms. Cantor, the floor is yours. Um, hi, thank you, um, the city council members, um, uh, for the, uh, the time to speak. Uh, Laura Cantor, I am um, an activist, maybe an anarchist sometimes. Um, I'm also the director of policy advocacy and youth services at the LGBT Center in Orange County. I have a master's degree in social welfare from UCLA and have been a clinical social worker as well as an organizer and advocate. And I do get my dry cleaning done here in the city of Santa Ana. Um, so, I want to start out and say that um, I feel like we need to be clear that this is not about an attack on hardworking police officers or jail staff, um, nor is it about villainizing these people. Um, this is about basic human dignity. And um, it, it, it breaks my heart that um, systems end up pitting reasonable people against one another in a situation like this. 
Um, transgender women are probably the most um, misunderstood, marginalized, and vulnerable in our society. It has become evident to me um, and to advocates across the country um, that ICE is, is, is unprepared and ill-equipped to provide the robust support necessary to ensure the proper and dignified care of transgender women. Despite the willingness of the jail administrator, the chief of police, to try to improve the situation, I do not believe that it is possible, given, uh, given the terms of the transgender care memorandum, given the lack of comprehensive training, and given the profound um, lack of understanding about who transgender women are. I did not hear any of the officers who spoke talk about their understanding or awareness of transgender women. Um, and um, I believe that continuing to operate a city jail under a contract with ICE will not best serve the needs of the detainees unless one accepts that immigrants without documentation needs to be jailed in the first place. A jail cannot best serve a population it does not understand. Transgender women do not need to be rehabilitated. They need to be understood. Today, the Santa Ana Police Officers Association stated that um, the issue of detention is not one that can be solved by the city of Santa Ana. This statement brought to mind for me a well-known words of Pastor Martin Niemöller. I'm sure you've heard them before, but I felt that it was very fitting here. Who was imprisoned in a Nazi con concentration camp from 1937 to 1945. First they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for the communists, and I did not speak out because I was not a communist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out. And when they came for me, no one was left to speak out for me. I think we have to be aware of telling a group of empowered advocates and activists that there is a problem we cannot solve. Ms. And Cantor, if you could wrap up, just... I believe that well, we must demand that ICE um, should work to implement alternatives to detention which are more humane, effective, and less costly than detention. And in the absence of federal action to end immigration detention and deportation, the city of Santa Ana has a moral imperative to prevent the possibility of more detention. Thank, Thank you, you for your testimony, Ms. Cantor. <laughs> so, Mr. City Manager, Madam uh, City Attorney, and Madam City Clerk, I have a bit of a quandary. We've lost three council members, and I'm about to lose one more because of... Uh, uh, physical illness. So what are our options at this point? I believe we'll lose quorum. We, we, we may not be able to continue with this uh, matter or the balance of the uh, calendar. If you um, lose a quorum, your, your council meeting will be considered um, terminated and the city clerk would have the responsibility of adjourning you to another time and place. May I ask, is it possible for us to make comments before we lose quorum? Um, it would be possible to make comments, but the City Council would not be um, allowed under the Brown Act to take any actions until all public comment on this item is completed. Well, is that the, uh, is that the uh, willingness of the Council? I'll go ahead and defer to my colleagues, and especially my colleague who's not, not feeling as well as, um, as we would, and, all, and we know that all, you know, unfortunately He's there's green. bugs going around. He's you're, turning you're, green. You're turning green. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've, it's been a number of days. I haven't been feeling too well, and I've been holding out uh, as long as I can. But I know the city manager has some a, a question or comment, and then I also have a question of, of the city attorney with regard to the balance of speakers. I, I, I guess that, it's a, it's a question for, uh, I believe that, um, and I'm talking out loud here uh, with the city attorney and the remaining council members, if, if we could get uh, at least some thoughts from the council members, that would... That would be helpful, uh, knowing we wouldn't take a vote. But I would come back on May 17th with some options uh, for your consideration with the full city council. And, and given the fact that the council wasn't able to take a vote today, only give some comments, I would probably uh, provide the full range of options for consideration for the council at the, at the May 17th meeting. Very good. I think that's what the council members hopefully uh, desire. We, we can wind up. Um, would this matter be continued to the following meeting or to the 17th of May with, um, with some options and alternatives where the entire council, uh, hopefully the seven of us, are here in one room healthy and willing to take this on. But um, why don't we go ahead and maybe take some comment prior to continuing the matter if that's something, because we won't be taking any action. Can, um, can, the, can the, uh, this is the question, can the item just not, no action today and a whole other set of options be presented? Correct. Um, the question is that um, 
So you want the four of you to remain here and take comments? Why don't you want to? Well, before we continue the matter, if we can comment He's saying before if the we can comment before. Right. We can comment, but you haven't completed taking um, all the public comment. I guess that's there's still a, there's still some speakers that need to be heard from. The language in the Brown Act says that all members of the public shall be provided a final opportunity before the council takes any action on an item. Um, I don't. I just my only concern is whether your comments would be considered action, even though they're not action. That would be the concern. Um, uh, less than a quorum of you can always communicate with the city manager. Um, without creating a violation of the Brown Act, if there were those of you that wanted to, that desired to do that, that would be my preference. That if we have any compelling arguments to make to the city manager or any comments, I think we could do that offline. I'd rather not violate the Brown Act. I think that what we have here is a a very very small group of council members left, and 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 again, we can't technically continue on uh, addressing the matter and. Uh, just my question for the balance of the speakers that haven't had an opportunity to address the council. Do we hold those cards and can we notify them to uh, come back with us when we revisit this matter? Yes, yeah, so you have two options at this point. You could actually adjourn your meeting because there are four of you to adjourn it and to adjourn this item and the balance of your agenda. Um, or if you lose your quorum, then it would be up to the city clerk to work with the city manager and determine an another date to continue. It's your choice. <laughs> Comments, thoughts from the council members? I think we need to adjourn to make sure that we don't do that. And if we have any comments, let the council members who remain make those comments. Final question, Mr. City Manager. You had a work study on the budget. Will that disrupt the, the, uh, the timeline that you have? Uh, no. We, uh, we uh, have this item posted on the agenda. It's uh, been available to the public. We have a whole series of meetings scheduled. It was a work study, but we'll maintain our schedule. Thank you. Uh, with that, I will, uh, since it's the pleasure of the council to adjourn by um, this council, I'll entertain a motion for adjournment. Motion to adjourn. I'll, I'll second that, and, and I do apologize. Just a few of us have not been uh, understood. We've well. all been sick. We've, we all know that. A motion is by uh, Council Member Thina Hedo, second by Benavides. All those in favor? All those opposed? Motion carries. Uh, we will be adjourning this matter, and we now stand in adjournment. Thank you very much. <laughs>